If you're watching this, you're in the right place for wildlife and Africa. This is Safari Live. Welcome to Safari Live. My name's Hayden Turner and we are sitting in the middle of the African bush on the Juma Game Reserve in Sabi Sand, South Africa. It's a magical morning here. It's 12 degrees Celsius, or if you're in America and you're watching, it's about 54 Fahrenheit. And this is a very, very special transmission we're doing this morning, particularly it's a special school project for the New South Wales schools in Australia through Taronga Zoo uh, Education Department. And welcome everyone that's watching anywhere else in the world. It's great to have you with us. I've got Jean Andre on camera, he's uh, with me this morning and it is just a beautiful morning. There's a bit of cloud cover this morning, so it's going to be a little bit darker, a little bit longer. So about 10 or 15 minutes we'll get a bit more light. But we thought we'd just come back down. Last night uh, we left uh, these beautiful, beautiful cubs with their mama leopard down here. But the, the rules are that it, when it's this type of uh, sort of darkness or this type of light, we don't put any lights on the cubs or anything like that. So we're just going to leave it for a little bit. We're going to stay in the area. Just to give you a bit of an update, last night we had lions roaring around our camp. So there's lions on the property. We've got... Uh, Brent Leo Smith out on a walk, which is very, very exciting, and that's going to be coming to you live as well, and James Hendry on another vehicle. So we've got three different people, all different in, in different locations around. So what I'm going to do really quickly is I want to read out the schools that are watching, because I think that's really important. We get that out now, and we tell you who is watching from what schools. And I, when you hear your school's name, I want you to give a massive shout out so we can hear you in Africa, okay? Here we go. These are the schools that are watching this morning. Hassel Grove Public School, Warwick Farm Public School, Lansdowne Public School, Dareton Public School, Mingula Public School, Janali East Public School, Canley Heights Public School, Tyala Public School, Chittaway Public School, Maroolan Public School, Parameadows Special School, Hayes Park Public School, Nowra East. I think you were with us yesterday as well, Nowra. Fantastic to have you again. Modenville Public School, Carlton Public School, John Palmer Public School, Skeggs Redlands. Wow, guys, that's just around the play corner from where I live. So that's fantastic to have you on board as well. Victoria Avenue Public School, uh, Redlands Junior School as well. Brilliant stuff. Camaray, just right near where I live as well. And uh, Stratford Public School. So that is absolutely brilliant. And it's nearly a thousand students watching this morning. Makes us very, very proud and very, very excited to have you all on board. Now, it might look like I'm crying a little bit here, but we've just been driving through the wind uh, to get down to this location. So what I'm going to do is toodle along down here. It's getting a bit lighter. We're going to see what we can find. There could be anything out there. And if you've got any questions, you email them to us at Wild Earth. Uh, sorry, questions at wildearth.tv and we've got a fantastic group of people in our what we call our final control centre and they feed us the questions through our earpiece and we can answer you live. This is the exciting thing. So we're going to get on our way and then we'll cross over to the other guys and see what they're up to and see if we can find those lines for you. Remember everyone that this is the African bush. We're just going to go down here so whilst we're looking for something I'm going to cross over to the wonderful James Hendry and he can introduce himself and say hi to everyone. We'll see you right now. Good morning everyone there in Australia specifically. It's not morning for you of course, I believe it's about two o'clock in the afternoon. My name is James Hendry on camera today we've got Brian the Thumb Joubert. Brian the Thumb looks... oh. He's got his tie on today, doesn't yeah, he? Minimalist a, tie. a minimalist tie. That's a tie, everybody. <laughs> Brian is not a small man. He's about six foot four. I am not that tall. I'm not going to tell you how tall I am. 
because it's not relevant. And we're on a live safari, as Hayden has told you, in the northeast corner of the world's most beautiful country. Now, I'm sure all of you Australians think that you live in the world's most beautiful country. Well, we're out to show you that you do not today. And we're going to drive around this little patch of land and see what exciting things we can find. Um, we had, as Hayden told you, the most unbelievable experience with four lionesses and a buffalo last night. And we've come into that area to see if we can't find some sign of how that went unfolded. The buffalo, the most amazing thing about it was the horrible raking sound of the buffalo's skin being torn or rent by the lion's claws as they jumped up on and then kicked with their hind legs. Now, I don't know if any of you have got house cats. I suspect many of you do. And you know when a house cat's playing, um, it rakes with its back legs. And sometimes, if they're not playing, they stick their claws out. Well, imagine a house cat that is, well, um, lioness is roughly about 180 kilograms. So that's, well, that's about 20 times the size of a normal house cat. Can you imagine the size of your house cat with 20 times that size raking away at the skin? It's a terrifying and horrible thing. But the buffalo got away. Clever fellow that he was, brave fellow. He made a horrible bellowing noise. He's in, in these bushes somewhere around here. We don't want to go walking through here right now. You don't want to find a buffalo bull on his own. Uh, well, very irritated still by the lions that he saw. The lions walked off up this road. We're going to see if we can find their tracks. You can see the dawn has yet to break. There's a, just a little bit of light from the sun. You can see there a bit of a cold front has moved in during the course of the evening. And there the sun is going to pop up fairly soon. So we've got the spotlight out and we're driving quite slowly because we don't want to miss anything. And that is the general play. Now, please do talk to us during the course of our little drive. I think you, the Australian schools are only with us for an hour, so try and get your questions in. We'll answer anything you like, well, within reason, of course, and we'd really like to enthuse you about this incredible wilderness area. Yes, this is an incredible wilderness area, possibly one of the most incredible ones in the world, but wherever you happen to be in the world, especially in Australia, there are lots of great wilderness areas there and so that we hope that we can infuse and instill some kind of enjoyment of the wild here that you can enjoy back home as well. Righty, the other thing to tell you is that we're going to try and add to our list and get to a hundred species. Uh, that can be trees and grasses or birds or spiders or mammals or whatever it else it is that we find. So we'll do that and while I'm on the hunt for species let's go back to Hayden and get an update from him. Fantastic stuff from James there, and he's out looking for as anything he possibly can as well. So we've just come around a corner here, and we're just doing a little bit of a scan. This is what we do in the mornings, guys. We go down, and we look at some water points, and we just have a bit of a drive around. We look for tracks as well. Tracks are really important. So we've got a question. got a, a question from Zara in Tyala Public School. Welcome aboard. So lovely to hear you and see you. I'm going to come to your question in a second. I think we've got a little little diker down here. Oh, very, very difficult to see in the dark. But you can just see there, just running across. I think it was a diker. I couldn't quite see there. It was a diker, wasn't it? It's a beautiful little antelope, very, very timid little antelope running down there. But Zara, you're asking if we come and do this every day. We certainly do. I work at Taronga Zoo, Zara, so I come and do this when I get an opportunity, and I'm really, really lucky to be here. Um, I used to do this a little bit more often, but now I work back at the zoo. I just thought it would be a fantastic thing to connect the zoos with these live drives. Do you believe this, Zara? We're coming to you live from Africa, and I'm talking to you in your classroom with your school. Tayala Public School, you rock. Fantastic for being on board. And, uh, yeah, we do this every day. Fantastic. Another question from Tyala, fantastic. Charlie, um, are buffaloes nocturnal? Well, they're not really, Charlie. They're, uh, 
they do walk around at night, but they normally find a nice place to, uh, to sort of sit at night in an open area. They're mainly operating during the day or walking around during the day. They're grazing animals, so they'll be grazing on grasses, but sometimes they eat a, little, a few bushes and things when the food supply is not fantastic. So um, they do walk around at night, uh, but sometimes they'll, you'll see them, you'll come across them all sitting in a group uh, looking after each other. Buffalo are very social animals, which means they do have a, a really sort of good mix of uh, males and females in the herd there, and they'll sit there and they'll look after each other. They protect each other fiercely, particularly from one creature, which we did hear last night, lion. So what we're doing now is driving up a, uh, a road here that is two properties between us, and the animals don't have any fences, they just walk from side to side. We're looking for some more. I'm just going to drive up the road and then cut back in here. But fantastic question, Charlie. If we do find some buffalo, we'll definitely show you, okay? A question from Kirsty in Paramedos. Fantastic to have you on board, Paramedos. Great stuff to see that you're watching this live. Um, do you think we'll find any lines? Look, we can... great to understand that we're in the African bush. We're definitely not in a place that we can just go to an animal exactly where we, they, they're sitting every, every place the same day. We have to go searching for them, and it does take a lot of effort, and we really have to... Uh, keep our eyes open. Jandre uh, on the back here operating the camera, he's got a really keen set of eyes as well. He sits up a little bit higher than I do, so he'll be looking around as well, keeping his eyes wide open. We'll cut back in here and see what we can see, but it's getting a bit lighter now as well. So we're only about 10 minutes into our live broadcast, so we've got 50 minutes and see what we can find. Anything we can find, we will show you. Um, but it's a bit cold here this morning, it's 12 degrees and as we're driving I start to have tears coming out of my eyes so I'm not crying because I'm feeling uh, sad, I'm just crying because it's cold. What do you reckon, Jandre? Lansdowne Public School, welcome aboard. Give us a big cheer, guys. Fantastic to hear you're on board. Uh, this is the biggest safari vehicle in the world, and you guys, I've got a 1,000 kids on the back of this. This is brilliant. Lansdowne, you're asking whether uh, it is, what time it is here. It is 10 past 6 in the morning. We've been up since about 4.30 this morning to get this ready, and uh, so we're eight hours behind you. You're ahead of us in time, Australia, and we're in South Africa, and your teachers can probably show you and have a look on a map and have a little chat about time zones and how that works. So I've been out here for about two or three weeks now. I've been in another country called Namibia, which is west of South Africa, and I've been over there doing a bit of work as well. So I'm only here for a week, which is, I love being here, but I've got a really wonderful uh, little boy and wife at home as well in Australia, so I'm really looking forward to get back to them. But Lansdowne, fantastic to have you on board, and give us a big cheer because I can't believe that you're watching live from Australia. It's just brilliant. Hats off to all the teachers too, all the teachers that got this together. Give your teachers a bit of a round of applause, everyone. Everyone, I want you to hear giving your teachers a clap to thank them for putting this together and getting you on board this live safari from Africa. Right, Jandre, we need to rub our lucky hands together. I want to hear everyone in Australia rubbing their lucky hands together to find us some creatures. So it's a really good thing to know. We... We need to make sure that we understand that this is wild. And sometimes the animals are here, sometimes they're not. We're going to do our best. But I'm going to cross over to James because I think he's got something really interesting to show you. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. I'm standing here on a termite mound surveying the landscape to see something that has occurred during the night. Now, I'm sure as Hayden has said, anything can happen around the corner and the roads are a particularly important part of what we do because they have the tracks, they are the, basically the morning newspaper is how the cliché goes and we can see what moved around during the course of the night and hopefully what it did. That over there is the west and I can see another road sort of 
off in the distance there, and I was hoping to see if something wasn't in between us and them. There isn't any thing there at the moment. We're going to head off to the west. There's a dam over there. Animals do like to drink it in the night and if you look around the landscape here you can see that we're in the middle of something of a drought and we're also in the middle of the dry season so animals do like to have a drink around the night time now. I'm standing on a termite mound. Now you've all got termites there in Australia and this particular termite is called Macrotermes natalensis. You can tick that off as a species and they make these tremendous castles of clay and there are probably more than a million termites in that termite mound. The most interesting thing about them of course, are, well there are thousands of interesting things about them, but the queen termite is this big. She's half a foot, 15 centimeters long. She lays 20,000 eggs every day. Now I reckon your average termite probably lives, say, about a month or so. But if you multiply 20,000 by, say, 30 days, that is uh, about 6 million termites a month that she lays. So you can imagine how many termites there must be inside that mound. Building away, they're a bit dormant at the moment because it's quite cold. We're still in the middle of winter, as you all are in Australia. But it's starting to warm up a bit and the termites will become more and more active. Righty, on we go. Still no sign of those lions. I've seen a few hyena tracks on the road, uh, but we haven't found any sign of the lions. And the other important thing to do on a morning like this is to listen. You've got to do a lot of listening out here, a lot of smelling. It's not, they're not two senses we're often very good at using anymore as human beings but you've got to have a good listen, see if the lions are roaring, see if you can hear them feeding, see if you can hear a leopard perhaps making a territorial call or an impala making an alarm call. There is an impala everybody, this is our most common antelope. Do you see it Brian? Oh there it is. Are there a few more over there? I think there are a few more, let's just carry on. That's an impala everyone, he's just relieving himself in the morning. <laughs> woken up and he's needed to go to the loo, so that's what he's doing. There we are. Now, let's watch him carefully. Hello, Maya from Athelgrove. Maya, you want to know how we look for footprints? Well, we just look on the ground, Maya. It's exactly the same. You've been on a beach, I'm sure. Now, you've seen the tracks of dogs on a beach, for example. It's exactly the same. We just look for their footprints. Uh, in the sand, in the soft sand. It's very difficult in the hard sand, but in the soft sand, that's where we're looking. Now, that's an impala, the most common antelope we get here. It's a male. You can see he's got big horns, and he's also relieving himself uh, because uh, he's been sat all night, probably, re-chewing the food that he ate during the day. Now, many of you will know that a cow is a ruminant, and a ruminant, of course, is an animal that re-chews its food. So you'll see he's starting to graze again now, He'll swallow that food, that'll go into the first stomach, and he'll then lie down when the first stomach is full, uh, like he did last night, regurgitate it into his mouth, rechew it very finely, and then it'll go down into the other four chamber or three chambers of the stomach, and eventually it will go out. I guess it's just done this morning. Hello, Nicholas. In Has at Hasselgrove School, you want to know what animals we see most often? Well, probably the impala, actually. That's the most common antelope that we see here. But remember, an animal can be a termite, it can be a bird, it can be a reptile, an amphibian, it can be a spider or a scorpion. But that's probably the most obvious one right there. Now we've got two birds close by here. I'm not sure if they're on the species list. And there is a fork-tailed drongo just above another young impala. Lila, you want to know if we ever touch the animals. We don't touch the animals, Lila. This is a completely wild area. It's not a zoo. It's a game reserve. And so, you know, if I was to get out of the car and walk towards that impala, he would run away. He wouldn't let me get anywhere near him. That's a fork-tailed drongo. You can see that, obviously, because it has, Brian, a... Eh? Fork tail. Correct. It has a forked tail, a tail that looks like a fork. And there are lots of different kinds of drongos in the world. Only two out here. Listen to him calling. I'm going to be quiet for a second. He stopped calling now, but that doesn't matter because Hayden has got something really special to show you.
Wow. Can you see anything in this picture? Look at that. A spotted hyena. And we just came around the corner to a location that we were at yesterday. Now, a couple of the schools that are watching today were with us yesterday. And this location, if you were with us, is the same location that the leopard was. Karula, a really famous leopard that we sat with. And her cubs were with her as well. Now, she had some food for her youngsters. She had an impala, which you just saw with James, that we have to understand that this is a... A wild, wild place, everyone, and you know what, you, if you haven't done food chains yet, uh, or you're not at that stage at school, um, then maybe the teachers could explain a little bit about that to you. Uh, but if you have done food chains, you'll know that the carnivores, the what we call the apex predators, the ones that are at the top of the mountain, the top of the food chain, right at the top, are the carnivores, the lions, the leopards, the hyenas, the cheetahs, and things like that over here. So really important to understand how that works all the way down. There's a hyena. Do you want to see something else? We've got a question from Adelpho in Redlands Junior School. How long do the cubs stay with the mother and father for? Well, it depends, you know, there's a lot of different stories, but about 18 to 18 months uh, to about two years, they'll be sort of kicking around with the parent, but um, then she'll start to push them away, particularly this is in the what we're talking about with leopards. So the cubs at the moment uh, with uh, Karula are seven months old. They were born on the 2nd of February here. So we've got a, a hyena over here because we knew that he was going to... Uh, smell that food over the next couple of days and he will come uh, or she will come very hard to tell males and females that <coughs> are part in hyena beautiful beautiful animal and I really want to tell you kids really important to understand that these animals are as beautiful as all the other animals around they fit into the ecosystem very importantly they are really really interesting interesting animals they're not quite dogs and they're not quite cats they fit into this middle sort of ground they're more like cats than they are dogs now they are the females are in charge and the females are much much bigger than uh, the males the females they have a, what's called a communal den so there might be uh, different females in that den and when they have cubs the, ma the males don't spend any time around there and are not really allowed anywhere close to the den when they've got cubs. So they're really fantastic animals, very, very interesting as well. And you have to understand that, you know, all the stories you may have heard about hyenas, I want you to put them to the side and walk away from Safari Live this morning knowing that you're looking at a beautiful, wonderful, wonderful creature, the spotted hyena who fits into the ecosystem very, very per well in, in Africa. Now, you might want to do a project at school and do a little bit more uh, work on that and have a look at all the top, all the apex predators or all the top carnivores in Africa and have a little look about... Uh, what's what's important about them and where they fit in now Jandre and I got very excited a second ago because we thought hmm we can't find <coughs> the leopard we can't find the leopards anywhere can anyone see anything in this picture hmm a tree a tree trunk have a close look at this can anyone see it first school to email us I'll give you an extra special shout out anyone see anything in there oh oh uh oh what's that I can see a few spots I can see a few spots in there there is a leopard sitting right there see those spots there's a leopard that is Karula she's hiding up in that tree because leopards and hyena don't get on very well that's for sure both big carnivores and what happens is once the leopard uh, has a kill they normally will hoist it up that tree to get it away from pre other predators like lion and and hyena 
and that's the advantage that the leopard has. They are the most incredible climbing uh, cat. They, they can do things that no other cats can do and they will drag that, uh, that food up into that tree. So you've got in that same uh, picture there that Jondre's got, we've got the leopard in that tree and we've got the hyena waiting down there to try and get any little bits of food that she drops. Uh, and she would have had put her cubs somewhere very, very safe and they'll be well out of harm's way. So whilst we're sitting here watching this hyena and see what happens, we're going to cross over to another very, very special member of our team, Brent Leo Smith, who is actually walking in the African bush. And we're sending you these signals live from Africa. It's so good to have you on board, kids. Can't wait to come back to you. Let's go and see what Brent's up to. Welcome to the middle of the African bush on a live safari. I'm on foot. My name is Brent Neosmith. smith I have the incredible cameraman Vian with me, and we've got Herbie behind us on security patrol, making sure while I'm talking to you, nothing sneaks up to me. So it's really dark this morning, but we are tracking lions. And if we have a careful look with my torch, we can see there's a lion print down here. And they were hunting buffalo last night. So we're going to keep following. Hopefully, they've caught a buffalo. But of course, it's not only about the big cats, the hairies and the scaries. And a big welcome to all the Taronga Zoo family and all the schools in Australia. Now, of course, when you get a toothache at home, all you do is you go to the dentist. Out in the bush, we don't have too many dentists. And elephants and other animals get toothaches as well. So, certain tree species are high in tannins. And this is one of them. It is called a silver custody. Now... If I, I'm going to do this just because it doesn't taste very nice, but if I had a sore tooth, what I'd do, I'd get a whole bunch of these leaves. I'd try to get the greenest ones possible, but that's a bit difficult at the time of the year. And chew. Okay, we're just trying to reposition here and get a bit of picture of this uh, leopard for you. What is that like, Jandre, for you? Make it forward. A bit more. Question from Brody in Hassel Grove Public School, and just wanted to know. I'm sorry, I missed the, the tail end of that question, Brody. Just let me ask for it again. Brody, I'm not really sure how old this hyena is, but um, it, if we look down there, it's an adult, and it could probably be three, four, five years old, maybe. Brody, it's an It's got a bit of a limp, actually. So uh, we're not sure what's happened because overnight anything could have happened between these, these animals. They are fierce enemies, uh, but it, is, it sounds a bit harsh, but it is the way of the African bush. And the hyena is right underneath uh, this leopard at the moment. We've got a question from Connor in Tyala Public School. And Tyala, you're a great school. Great to have you on board. And Connor, you want to know what hyenas eat. Well, hyenas are what we call opportunistic. They will take anything they possibly can from another, another predator. But they also uh, are fierce hunters. They're very, very successful hunters. And uh, when they can or when they need to, they'll hunt. But uh, they'll also, they've got an incredibly keen sense of smell. Uh, and they will try and steal a kill from another animal without, without question. So they will patiently wait underneath there, and uh, sometimes they go to sleep, and that's a really incredible thing to see, that leopard sitting in the tree there, and right underneath, directly underneath, is the hyena, and the hyena is waiting for any food that, that uh, falls out of that tree uh, from that leopard. So... 
Connor, just to answer your question again, uh, anything they possibly can, and they will eat old bones. They've got the ability to crunch through bones like no other animal. And I have to tell you something else is interesting. Their poo is really, really white. They have lots and lots of calcium from the bones in their in their poo, and we know we can see that very obviously. And if I find some, I'll grab some for you. Harrison from Redlands Junior School. Great to have you on board, mate. Really great. You're just around the corner from where I live in Sydney. It's great to have you. Um, how do leopards catch their food? Well, the leopard is the absolute uh, superstar, the Olympian of, uh, of catching its food. And they are the quietest of the cats. They, they stalk. They stalk. We call them the Prince of Stealth. They stalk like a, like a ninja and they get so, so close to their prey and then they get so close that their, the prey or the animal that they're going to catch cannot escape. <clears throat> they eat all different types of things and uh, from little tiny lizards up to uh, all like baby giraffes sometimes. So they've got to eat, they've got cubs as well and it's all part of the food chain. Thanks so much, mate. got a question from Jake in Marulan Public School and want to know how long leopards live for. Well, some of the books say up to about 15 and then I've read some of the other books that say up to about 20. Jake, it really does depend on where they are and how much pressure they've got from other animals. Um, sometimes they can be lucky, Jake, as well. They can have a really good long lifespan because there's not a lot of other predators in their area. Or sometimes they might have a fight with another animal or another leopard, for that matter, and get an injury. Remember, there's no vets out here in the wild. Uh, they, we, nature takes its own course here, and if an animal get, does get an injury, sometimes it can heal and other times it can't. But normally 15 to 20 years if they're lucky. Riley from Hassel Grove, great to have you on board as well. Fantastic to see that you're watching, guys. That's a great question, Riley, about how old is this leopard. Well, we don't often know how old our leopards are, but this particular leopard, this is Karula, and she's known as the Queen of Juma. She's a very famous leopard, and she's a beautiful, beautiful leopard, and we know when she was born. She's 12 years old, uh, so she's getting towards the end of her breeding uh, being able to be a mum around 15, 12 to 15 so she's 12 years old and uh, she's an incredible incredible cat we're very lucky to be with her and I'm so excited to be able to show you a wild leopard Hunter from Redlands again Brilliant question. How old is a leopard when it learns to climb a tree? Well, Jandre and I were here yesterday and we saw, we went to leopard school yesterday. It was brilliant. Uh, Karula took that food up into that tree for her cubs to teach them how to get up there and feed. And that was at about, uh, they're seven months old at the moment. But Jandre, I can ask Jandre the question actually. When was the first time you saw these cubs maybe climb, start to climb? When they're about two months? So Jandre's been here for a lot, you know, he works here all the time. And uh, Jandre just said the first time he saw the, the leopards start to climb a tree was about two months. So they'll start to experiment, just like us as kids. We'll start to climb things in the playground or trees or whatever. Is, and the, the, the leopards start to experiment like that as well. But we saw the leopards yesterday at seven months old go up that tree really, really quickly. So great question, mate. Thanks so much for watching. So you might hear another um, vehicle arriving, kids, and uh, that vehicle is another game drive vehicle out looking for wonderful animals as well. Ruby from Camaray Public School, fantastic to have you. Again, just around the corner from my place, Ruby. 
Really love to have your whole school with us today. Um, <clears throat> Ruby, you want to know whether hyenas uh, use termite mounds? I think that's what the question is. Just let me double check what that question is again. Yeah, great, Ruby. It is. I wasn't sure if I heard it correctly uh, just when that other vehicle pulled up. Um, Ruby, the... They do use termite mounds as a, to put makers' dens to, to have their cubs. Um, and you know what? There's another animal, and maybe you guys could have a look on a, online or you could have a look in some books with your teacher and look up an aardvark. Aardvark is a fantastic animal that we don't see very often. And aardvarks dig holes in termite mounds and make their dens. And then after they uh, move locations or move to another house, um, other animals take over their spot and you might get warthogs moving in you might get hyenas moving in you might get african wild dog moving in to have their pups and sometimes they do renovations just like we do on our houses and uh, they make them bigger they make them different and leopard will definitely also use them sometimes as well great question ruby thank you so much We've got a great question from Miss Martin, from Miss Morrison, sorry, from Carlton Public School. Welcome aboard, and hats off to you, teacher. So, ma'am, you've got these guys watching us live this morning, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much, Miss Morrison. Uh, it really, really hats off to all the teachers again. You want to know whether um, hyenas use their spots as camouflage, and uh, if they really do laugh like you see in movies and things. The vocalization of uh, the hyenas definitely does sound a little bit like a laugh, and it does get quite frantic sometimes when uh, it's a real social thing. There's lots of different uh, types of vocalizations they use to communicate. So it does sound a little bit like a laugh, and that's why sometimes they do get that laughing hyena uh, name called to them. But spotted hyena is their correct name, and the spots would definitely give them camouflage. Um, sometimes it's really hard to see a, a hyena moving through the bush or even if you're just sitting there and they're lying flat, they're very, very difficult to see. So, yeah, thank you very, very much, Miss Morrison, for, for coming on board and bringing your kids. So what we're going to do now is whilst we're staying with this spotted hyena and Karula the leopard, we're going to link over to James and see what he's up to. But fantastic questions, kids and teachers. Keep them coming through. We'll come right back to you just now. Right, everybody, we're driving around at quite a speed at the moment because the bushwalk, as you've just seen, has got some lion tracks. They're not too far from here. They've got what we call some nyala, which are a different kind of antelope barking. That, they don't bark like dogs. Well, they do a little bit. But when they see something they don't like, like lions, for example, they go, bah, bah, bah. And that low-frequency sound travels through the bushes and to our ears and then we can follow up and see if they're what they're barking at so that's where the bushwalk is and we're going to head down in that direction the little bird that you saw flying over there that was a hornbill everybody you've all seen the lion king that's like the zazu bird hayes park school you want to know where exactly we are in africa we're in the northeast corner of south africa so if you imagine a map of africa sort of the fat bit of the Sahara at the top and then comes down to the south where we are with the southernmost part of Africa uh, and then we're in the northeast corner and that's called the Kruger National Park. It's eight and a half million acres or three and a half million hectares of wilderness here in the northeast corner. It's one of the most famous national parks in all the world. It was one of the, I think it was probably one of the very first and it's almost a hundred years old now it was a good question thank you now you have seen lots of the trees here don't have much in the way of leaves on them but there are a few things that are quite interesting can Brian can we look at the baboon's tail there there's a plant there called the baboon's tail you see that and that's a very important plant locally you can use that as one of the species its Latin name is zero fighter retinervus 
and the local people here use it to ward off lightning. So if there are storms, people will plant that plant, plant that plant, around their homes, and that will hopefully stop the lightning striking the roof. That is the baboon's tail. Let us continue. I'm going to move up a little quicker, see if we can't find those lions. Now, Lansdowne Public School, uh, you were asking as a collective and you want to know how long we see lions, how, how often we see them. We see them just about every day. I'd say probably five times a week or so we'll see lions. So there's a really good chance we'll see them today. I just hope we see them while you are all still with us. There's nothing down here. I've seen lions eating a nyala in this very place here. There's nyala with the antelope that were alarm calling with the bushwalk. But they're not eating anything here right now. <laughs> it's a very, very, very good question here from Seaham Public School. You say... <laughs> You say, what time do we get up in the morning? Very early is the answer, uh, always before sunrise. So in summer, that's obviously much earlier. We start, we get onto the vehicles at half past four in the morning. So we're normally out of bed by four, uh, depending on whether you want coffee or not. Brian doesn't drink coffee in the morning, so he can get up just before he gets up. But I get up at four o'clock in the morning in summer. And then Ash, you want to know how many hours we do this for a day? Three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening. And uh, it just depends. It gets earlier as the sunrise gets earlier. So we try and be around around sunrise and then around sunset because that's when most of the animals are active and moving about the place. Now, just listen carefully here. Isn't that a beautiful sound? That is the sound, everybody, of a beautiful African morning. It's a white-browed scrub robin you can hear going. And then you can also hear a woodpecker going. Tick, 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 tick. That's the bearded woodpecker. You can count both of those species. Then we had a question about the size of this wilderness area that we are traversing. Uh, we are traversing an area of roughly 3,000 hectares, which if you operate in acres, is about 6,500 acres. Isn't that a lovely sound? Just spotted him, Brian. Now everyone, I know the lions are very exciting, but these little things, these little creatures are, when you spend a lot of time here, they're just as exciting. Just going to quickly see if we can't find this um, white wild scrub robin. There he is. He's in that greenish tree moving around there. No, that's not him. Look, look, everybody's go. That's, that's a chin spot batis. Isn't he lovely? That's a chin spot batis. Let's head back to Brent. He's on foot and he's got a little more signal and hopefully some more lion tracks. So we disappeared last time when I was explaining about dentists in the bush. So we were looking at a silver cluster leaf, which is the name of the tree I was chewing on last time. But there's another tree that is also used uh, as, for, as a dentist, and human beings are not the only ones. Uh, baby elephants chew this when they've got sore teeth, when they're teething. Now, of course, it's a Taronga Zoo's 100th uh, centenary year, and we're looking to find 100 species out while we're about in the African bush. So we've got our second tree species, and this is called the common spike thorn. And again, I'm going to do this because I like you, because it's very high in tannins, and especially with the drought we're going through now. Any leaf here is so high in tannins to stop the animals eating it, but it does work as a pain reliever for toothache. And now, I can feel my, <laughs> my gums start to go numb, and my tongue, so it's very unpleasant because I don't have a sore tooth. But if I did, I'd collect a whole big bunch of these leaves and chew on them and then leave them over my sore tooth. Mmm, yum. Not yum. Okay, we're going to keep looking for lions. 
Hi, Charlie. Uh, Charlie's from Seaham Primary. Charlie's wondering, what, how do I know what footprint belongs to what animal? Well, Charlie, I've been really lucky. I've had some incredible teachers in the bush, and I've grown up in the bush. So this is my classroom. So even when I was very little, I had a teacher who lived with us in the bush, so our classroom was literally in the middle of the bush. So if we have a look, let's try to find you a track. Here, yeah, Charlie, to show you. If we don't, I'll have to draw one, and that could be a bit embarrassing. Okay, here's a little bit of soft sand. On. So a lion or a cat has a paw, and so does a hyena. So a lion or leopard has little lobes like that at the back, and does that, and then you've got their toes. This is not the best drawing in the world, it gives you a good idea. Now if we were looking for a buffalo, a buffalo has got a two hooves, something like that. So there we go, buffalo hooves. And then if we had an impala or something smaller, gives you a good idea. So even if you uh, live out in Australia, go have a look. If you see a kangaroo go past, go look for the footprints and then you'll learn that, that animal's footprints. So that's one of the best ways. If you see an animal, you go and look for the footprint so you can learn it. Okay, let's keep moving. Josh and uh, is wondering, we, do we put any tracking devices on animals? And Josh is at Stratford. Uh, and the answer to that, Josh, is no. So uh, in certain circumstances, very rarely, if there's a scientific research project, we might do that. But normally, uh, we track them the good old-fashioned way, like we're doing at the moment. So what, we, what has happened is we've heard some Inyala alarm calling. So a lot of animals, if they see uh, a lion or a leopard, they'll warn everyone else. So imagine if you were walking down the street and you saw something dangerous coming and you shout a warning. It's exactly the same, except an Inyala's warning goes something like this. Bow! So it's a deep bark. And what he's saying is, lion, lion. And then all the other herbivores in the area will be able to hear that. So we're going to keep going through the bush here. And we're going very slowly, very carefully, in case the lions are close by. That's why we've got Herbie with us. And Herbie's making sure, while I'm talking to you, that I don't stumble into a lion. But here we go. This is quite a fascinating little spot. You can see elephants have been feeding here. Now, lots of big thorns on this. So this is our third tree. This is a red thorn, an acacia tree. So you can see the big thorns that are supposed to be there for defense. But an animal like an elephant has got a mouth like an old boot. So it's able to munch straight through that. Now the main part that the elephants are after, watch out there, I'm going to pull the thorns. Okay. Oh. See now imagine I'm an elephant. Do you know how strong they are? Because I'm quite a big guy and I'm still battling to pull this out. Oh, there we go. Okay. So here we go, have a look at this. Very interesting. You can see that this whole section has no bark on it whatsoever. There we go, so that is what the elephants are after. And they're after the bark because all the water and minerals and nutrients comes up from the ground into the branches through that. And what an elephant does, I'm not gonna do it because there's a lot of thorns on this one, is it'll put it in its mouth and it goes, and it literally grinds the bark off. You can see it doesn't even break the things, it grinds all the nutrient rich levels off. Yum, yum, yum. Bit nicer than the leaves I was eating earlier. I'd say, oh, I'm hooked. There we are, I'm off hook. So you will notice a lot of trees, and we might show you some other different trees as we walk through the bush that the elephants have been feeding on. But while we go carry on looking for our lions, uh, I know Hayden has got the second most dominant apex predator out here in the African bush. Well, our, our hyena friend has just moved away from underneath uh, Karula and gone back up onto the bank and laid down. And that's a good sign just to know that uh, there's going to be some interesting, interesting things happening here over the next few hours. The hyenas are incredibly patient creatures and uh, they will just wait until the opportunity is right and if any of that food falls down they will be taking it.
We've got a question from Tanita in Hayes Park School. Thank you so much for watching, guys. It's really, really cool to have you on board. Um, live from Africa. Do you believe that? You're watching this live in your classroom. We're answering your questions. You want to know if there's any endangered animals here. There's lots and lots of different endangered animals here in Africa. Um, when, but in our particular area, uh, we've got a, we're in a protected area here, so there's a very, very good lion population, li uh, leopard population, uh, there's great elephant populations and other animals, but um, there's not a lot that uh, I, I can mention here because it's, it's such a beautiful protected area, but outside sometimes that does happen and that might happen in any environment or any country where you've got uh, a lot of pressure on an area from uh, human population or habitat loss. That's one of the biggest things as well, Tanita. So maybe you guys could do a project at school and try and figure out uh, what animals in your local area, Australian animals, might be endangered and then have a look on the, the other side of the world and maybe compare it to another country uh, and just learn a little bit about endangered animals. We're very, very lucky to be in a protected area here. So one of the things I just want to say to you is any ideas that you get from this safari live broadcast maybe go out and have a look uh, do a project on all the predators in Africa all the predators in the world predators in Africa and predators in Australia anything you want but something really 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 cute that I want to show you have a look at this That is a leopard cub, and he is asleep. And he's just staying well away from that hyena, that's for sure. And he's quick enough now to be able to get up that tree very, very quickly. He's got a super keen sense here of hearing, and uh, he'll be definitely on his toes. He'd go right up that tree if that, le that uh, hyena came anywhere near. So his mum is up the tree over the other side, uh, and he is just lying down there, but he might look like he's asleep uh, and sound asleep if that leopard was even to tread on a leaf. I'm sorry, that hyena was to tread on a leaf. Uh, he would be straight up that tree. So um, they're at an age now where they can escape predators, but I have to say, you've got to be very, very careful because hyenas are very dangerous uh, for leopards. But at the same time, they are a very, very important predator. And I really want you all to walk away from Safari Live today knowing that hyenas play a very, very special, special place. Got a question from Caleb in Hassel Grove Public School. Great to have you on board, guys. Really wonderful to be able to talk to you live from Africa. And how many cubs are in a litter? It's normally one to three. There's not much more than that. And to have successful two cubs survive all the way through is incredible. Karula is an amazing mother, and she's uh, been a successful mother with a lot, a lot of cubs. So one to three is uh, is the um, is the number. I've got a, a question from Packy in John Palmer Public School, and you want to know where do leopards find protection when it comes to the rain? Well, you know what? A lot of animals actually cope with the rain a lot better than we do. We're a bit soft, us humans. We get out of it, we put our jackets on and our umbrellas. But you know what? Animals cope with the rain. Um, in extreme weather, so really, really um, bad weather, they might find a little bit of shelter up under a little ledge in a, in a dry creek bed or something like that or in a bush or and I have to say cats don't really love it. You see them, they're sitting there a little looking a bit sorry for themselves with the rain pelting on them, particularly lions, you see that. So they will try and find a bit of shelter but sometimes in open areas they don't have a choice so they'll just have to cope with it. They're pretty tough animals, a lot tougher than we are that's for sure. So one of the other things, whilst we're looking at this beautiful cub, I just want to ask you a little bit uh, to, to try and follow on from Safari Live today and try and come up with some project ideas with your teachers. 
uh, try and come up with some ideas. If you get stuck for any ideas, you can go onto the Taronga Zoo website. You can contact the Taronga Zoo Education Department as well, and we can give you loads of ideas because even though we're in Africa and we're talking to you about all these beautiful animals here, you've got just as beautiful animals in your home country as well. And you might be watching from somewhere else in the world, but I'm just talking at the minute to the Australian schools that are watching. Have a look at the animals that uh, are around your area and the animals that really need to have a little bit more uh, help in, in, in Australia. One of the animals that we really do uh, champion at Taronga Zoo is the corroboree frog. You might be able to do a little bit of a uh, project on that. We've got a great breeding prog program going there. Or you might be able to do it on the region honey eater, uh, marine turtles, loads of other things. Get onto the Taronga Zoo website and have a look for that. I think we've got a question from, is it Canley Heights? Uh, just con confirm that for me. Okay, we've got a question from, I think it's Conley Heights I'm getting uh, there at school. Let me just check the name of that. Um, how long does a le will a leopard protect? Conley Heights. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry, I just had a bit of a break up in my earpiece. Thanks, Rebecca. I do apologize. Um, so I'm talking to Rebecca. In, I'm getting messages from her in my earpiece about all your wonderful questions coming through. And I just, it just broke up a little bit as I got that name. Conley Heights, fantastic to have you on board. How long will the leopard look after its food? Well, it gets to a point. There's still a lot of food uh, up there, and she will protect that uh, food, but she's also very, very clever. She will stay up there. She might have a little bit more of a, uh, a meal on that, but now that this hyena's here, their patience is extraordinary. Their patience, they'll just wait and wait and wait. She might decide to, when she gets the opportunity, get down and leave that and take her cubs and go away, and then the hyena might just wait around for that. So we don't really know, but that's the fantastic thing about the bush. We'll just find out as we sit here and watch. Little leopard cubs put his head up there. He's just watching. And this one's name is Hasana? No, Shongile. I always get them mixed up. There's a boy and a girl. And this is Shongile. Gorgeous, seven months old, born on 2nd of February. Jessica from CM Public School. Fantastic to have you on board. Uh, great stuff. What's my favorite animal? Goodness, that's a hard question to answer. We get asked that question a lot. And you know what? I have to give an answer that I love them all, but I really do love leopard. I love giraffe as well, one of my favorite animals, and we've got loads of those at Taronga Zoo and Western Plains Zoo uh, out in Dubbo. Giraffe are one of my favorite creatures, and we, we haven't seen them a lot uh, the last couple of days, but I'm going to try and search for some. Um, I really love elephant as well, and uh, I love lion. I love African wild dog. I love everything, but giraffe and leopard are two of my absolute favorites. Thank you so much for watching, guys. We're just going to have a little look at that uh, hyena again. So really, I, I say it one more time, I want you to go away and see if you want to do a project on, on hyenas and find out a little bit more about hyenas because I think there's a lot of stories you hear about hyenas and you see them in movies, you might have seen them on cartoons or uh, some movies that have made hyenas out to be the bad guys. They're definitely not the bad guys. They are such fantastic creatures, incredibly interesting. They've got really, really interesting facts about them that I think uh, you should do a project on at school and maybe look into a little bit more and learn that hyenas fit into the ecosystem perfectly, just like all the other animals do. So the interesting thing for me, guys, is I'm going to tell you now, we've only got about two minutes to go, I think, um, and I just want to just finish up by saying to you how important it is that you, all of you watching right now, are our little special agents. 
You are our agents. You are our little soldiers in the army of conservation. And you are the ones that are going to keep this planet as it is, or you're going to protect this planet, protect all these animals in Australia, in Africa, in Asia, in North America. You are the ones that are going to protect them. And you don't know what the future is going to bring for you. And if you really want to work with animals or wildlife or conservation, you know what? You've got to follow your heart. You've got to follow your dreams. That's it. what I did. And when I was at school, I... Uh, I really wanted to be a zookeeper. I really wanted to do what I'm doing now, and I followed my dream. So you can do it. I'm nothing special. I'm just a normal, normal person, genre normal person. But all the other guys, Brent and James, all normal people. But we just followed our dream, and that's what we want to do. And you can do it too. That's the really important thing. You got to follow that dream. And if you want to work with wildlife, you can do it. Just wanted to let you know that what you're doing right now, and all your teachers. I tell you what your teachers have to have another round of applause. So I want you to all give a big cheer for your teachers right now and thank them all for doing such a wonderful, wonderful job. I'm going to round off and say goodbye. Jandre says goodbye. You'll probably see his thumb come round in a minute. And I want to say thank you so much to Taronga Zoo Education Department and Taronga Zoo Cons Taronga Conservation Society for allowing us to do this in collaboration with Wild Earth. Here we are on Safari Live from Africa right into your classroom guys it's been an absolute pleasure to be with you let's finish off by looking at this little cub we'll see you tomorrow if you're with us again have a great one guys Okay, guys, thank you very much, everyone else that was watching. We've uh, signed off with our schools in Australia, which is brilliant, and uh, what a great thing. Karula's just coming down. Karula's just coming down the tree. I'm not in a very good position here, guys, but I'm not, I don't dare move. She's come down the tree. I can't really move. The hyena has stayed exactly where it is. We've just got Karula through there. Very interesting here. So the hyena is staying exactly where it is. And it's laid back down. This is quite incredible. Normally you would see that hyena hop up and take the opportunity to scare that leopard off. But Karula is just out of shot at the moment. Just in there you can see her. And as I said, I don't really want to move the vehicle or start the vehicle, folks. So I know you understand. I just want to watch this behaviour with you. Picking up scent. You always see when those animals, they particularly hyena, put their head in the air like that. Thing we saw before. We saw that hyena come down underneath the uh, the tree where Karula was, and that hyena is limping, is very very lame on her on its back right leg. So we don't know what happened last night. We don't know whether there was a skirmish between those guys or whether it was an existing injury. But the thing that I am a little bit concerned about is I can only find one cub. But there's a good chance that um, the other little cub is holed up somewhere. We will cross over to James, and whilst we're looking for this other cub, we'll see what James is up to. I think he's got something quite special. We'll see you just now. We're having a very, very special sighting here, everybody. A big herd of elephants has just decided to cross the road, both sides of us, the big matriarch behind, the rest of them coming around the front.
And now they've stopped moving. They're just listening. Obviously, some command is being waited for by the matriarch behind us. She's just uh, finishing off her current stick for breakfast. Comes a younger cow. Good morning. Actually, a young, yeah, I think a young cow. And then a much bigger cow. That's her there. This is wonderful. Oh, this is just special. everyone completely relaxed this is so special oh and the smell of elephant everyone the smell of elephant is completely distinct and it is so nice it's like a sort of what do, how do I describe it a sweet leather and there they go we just move a little bit forward. And we can talk normally now. Ah, that was, <laughs> that was very special. So when we came through here, we, uh, they were all kind of silently in the bush and then as you came across to us, they started to move and they just blasted past us as some inaudible command was given probably by the matriarch. Now they're wandering down to the south. Uh, that does really fill the soul, I have to say. Uh, Justin S, you're wondering as they disappear into the woodland there what it is or how they know what trees to eat and which ones to avoid and do they learn? Yes, we think largely, Justin, that there is a huge mentorship process that takes place with young elephants, that the older ones teach them what to plants to eat and what to avoid. I think also there's a lot in the way of self-medication that goes on with the elephants. I think that they eat specific trees for the specific nutrients that they offer and that helps them maintain their health. This time of the year though Justin they're pretty much taking anything they can get but it's so interesting now we've just seen them or we were just watching them disappear it was quite clear that they had been feeding in the area where we were sitting for quite some time before they then decided to go off where they are now and you can see they're not feeding now they're not feeding through this woodland they're obviously moving to a different spot where the matriarch has told them or perhaps another older cow has remembered that there's some good food to eat so they moved from one feeding section and now they've moved off to another they didn't kind of feed through here and there's no obvious difference between the woodland where they are now and the woodland where they have been feeding. So quite interesting that I think. All right, let's go and find out what's happening on the bushwalk. Uh, we'll continue towards Bifosuk Dam. We're still on the trail of the Nkoma Pride of Line. We've just had some Inyala alarm calls not too far away. So the ground's really hard. We're just going very slowly, checking for tracks, and fingers crossed we're going to find them. But we're pretty sure they're in this area around us somewhere. We've just done a big loop up to the side to make sure they haven't gone north. And so far, so good. No tracks going north. So we're going to head back towards last tracks and try follow up on them again. But while we do that, let's go back to the cats in the bag with Hayden. Well, this is a, uh, a very interesting situation. Look at that. You don't get that very often. I'll just get out of your way. We've got Karula has just come down the tree and is lying 
only about probably three, four meters, five meters away from the hyena. That is quite incredible. Hyena didn't even flinch when uh, when Karula came down, but Karula has chosen to stay there as well. Now, I'm sure many of you uh, are concerned about Hasana, the other cub. We did just see a little remnant of a tail on the other side there, so both cubs are fine. Uh, all good. And I know that um, you, many of you would have been concerned, but um, everything is good there, and we're just now watching... So the cubs are well off. They're probably about, uh, you know, 30, 40, 40 metres away. Jondre is just going to try and find him over there in the tree. It's a very tricky spot we're in, where, as we said yesterday, you can just see some spots there. Just to the right of the trunk of that tree, there's some spots on the ground, and that's where Hasana is and Shongile is down below, who we had just down to the right down there. Um, Jondre is doing an amazing job this morning looking through all this uh, dense vegetation uh, but we're in a, a trick there you go there's a little bit of movement there so that's Shongile and then Hasana is up on the other side there so the cubbies are fine <coughs> excuse me please um, but I'm more mystified by this this incredible behavior that we've got uh, so look how quietly Shongile is moving very, very quietly. I don't know whether he's coming down. He's going down into the drainage line. We're going to lose sight of him in a second. But his mum is standing there, or lying there, that is for sure, with uh, every sense of hers on full alert at the moment. We could see some quite incredible behaviour here. It is absolutely incredible, folks. We're getting lots of people commenting on this, this incredible behaviour that we're watching at the moment. And I totally agree with everyone. I mean, normally what we see, folks, don't we? We see the hyena charge the, the leopard as soon as it comes out of the tree and chase it off, or the leopard just come down the tree and run. But Karula has chosen to... has chosen to... Uh, sit there Wayne has now stood up incredibly keen sense of hearing Extraordinary behaviour. Gorilla watching the hyena's every move. Definitely got a bad limp on that bright right hind leg. got a question from Michael, wondering uh, his question, and welcome aboard Michael, fantastic to have you with us, watching this incredible behaviour right here. Does Karula 
is Karula more relaxed now because she knows that the hyena is injured? Well, I would love to be able to say that I know that, Michael, but at a guess, we don't know what happened last night. We don't know whether Karula is responsible for that injury or whether it was an existing injury. So um, there is a possibility that Karula is intuitive enough to pick that up uh, or whether Karula did... Um, have an interaction with that hyena last night and is the one that's responsible and uh, she does know that. I really can't say that I could know either way, Michael, but it's a it's a very interesting perception and I, I did think of it myself before. Uh, she's definitely relaxed and around this and the interesting thing is the cubs also are at that age, seven months of age, they're fast, they're agile, they can ascend trees very, very quickly uh, they're alert, they're in a really good place. Um, I would be really concerned if we were looking at two-month-olds or something like that, but then again, they probably wouldn't be out and ex as exposed as they are. Um, but Karula is super chilled. Well, we're perceiving that she's super chilled, but uh, she's definitely not looking that stressed uh, about anything. But sometimes, you know what? I've seen, uh, I've been walking in uh, Pilonsburg National Park with a, a wonderful guide out there uh, years and years back and we went walking and there was a couple of uh, different species of antelope and you know what, they would see us and they would actually end up following us in a sense to keep us in vision. And, and sometimes uh, animals will like to keep another animal in its sights rather than running off and not knowing where that animal is. So I think Karula is in a good spot here. She knows where that hyena is. She knows where her cubs are. And, you know, sometimes animals do incredible things where, as opposed to running away, uh, and you see it a lot with predators around waterholes, you'll find the whole herd of zebras or, or impala or whatever would rather keep an eye on the predator rather than just taking off and then not knowing where it is because that's the time when you better to know where your enemy is rather to than uh, be guessing. Yeah, it was really interesting to find those antelope. We always keep this in their sights when we were walking through the bush. But yeah, that hyena is not looking 100%, I have to say. Might come through it, but... Uh, Quite an incredible thing to see a hyena lying down, resting, Karula lying down on the ground, resting, the cubs completely fine as well, and the kill still up the tree. Really incredible thing to see this morning. It still is in uh, quite an... Uh, an astonishing sort of behaviour when you do see a leopard that is, well, they're an adult, big, big adult leopard male is heavier than a striped hyena, a brown hyena, probably equal sometimes to a, a spotted hyena, but they will run always from hyena. They will fight, you know, when it comes to protecting the young and there'll be battles and those sorts of things, but... It does still mystify a lot of people why uh, these animals will actually run from hyena when they're incredibly powerful. But uh, they've definitely done it right for themselves. Okay, so whilst we're here, everything's settled, everything's quiet. We're going to stick with uh, Karula and the hyena and the cubs. I'm going to cross over to James and see how he's going with those beautiful big beasts if he's still with them or if he's found something else for us. We'll be back with you just now. We have seen two things everybody. One, a Stiernbock running at great speed down to the south and two, some Impala up ahead. Let's go and have a look at them. No, let's not. We can. I mean, we, we've seen Impala. I just want to see the one piece of inner bark that I haven't eaten is that of Zizifus mucronata. Would you like to eat some Zizifus mucronata inner bark, Brian? I am quite piggish. Yes, have you got a rusk today? I've got many rusks. Ah, well, 
You would maybe like to show the viewers one of your rusks while I retrieve you something nutritious. Um. <laughs> <laughs> now, here is Zizzy Force, everyone. And I'm going to cut away a bit of the bark with the knife that Steph very kindly sharpened for me. That's not quite the inner bark yet. One second. Right, here we go. One piece for me. One piece for Rusky Eater. Do you see how skilled I was with my knife there, Brian? Amazing. Whittling. I was whittling the wood. There you are. Thank you. Oh, yep. Yes, don't stab yourself. Mmm. It's actually really good. Mm, it's very really tasty. So mm, sweet. Mm, very sweet. Well, that's why they like it, everyone. Mm. And you can see how this particular one here. Sorry. Um, you can see how this stick has been completely cleaned. Completely, absolutely cleaned of bark. Amazing. Unbelievable. Sorry, I left the radio on. That's very bad of me. Very naughty indeed. Plug myself back in. It's one of those mornings that starts off relatively warm and remains at the same temperature, so you don't warm up because of this front that's coming through. That's really pretty good in a bark, I'd say. I think one of the best things that we've eaten. I think it might be one of the best things that we've eaten. How does it compare with your rusk? Um, yeah, a lot softer. And less palm oil. And less palm oil. Yes, yes. very good. Okay, let's head on down here. There's some impala further up. And also, we're going to head towards Bivelshoek Dam and see what we can find there. There were some tracks of lions, apparently, <coughs> oh, excuse me, heading this way. Um, but, I don't know. We haven't found tracks of that pride again. Herbert and Brent are still knocking about in the area where we think they went. Who knows? And they will there, the Impala. They will want to be a little bit careful, of course, of the buffalo that was injured last night by those lions. The lions may have killed it and be eating it somewhere. The lack of tracks crossing in and out of that block indicates to me that could well be the case. What do you think? You think yes? He just doesn't doesn't care. He's very disdainful of me, Brian. Mm. I think it's because you looked at him funny. I think it could be. It is amazing to me how an animal that is um well you know how it is with your with your with your house pets. How an animal that is seemingly unthinking and not a, is intellectually um, accomplished as we as human beings are, how if they ignore you, you feel so dreadfully, dreadfully rejected. There you are. I feel better now. Thank you. That's a sympathetic one there. There we are. <laughs> All righty. Let's carry on. And then he didn't care, as Rebecca says. Then he didn't care. Well, he didn't have any Zizifus bark. <laughs> I'm glad, look, I mean, it was quite nice, everyone. I mean, there's a sweetish taste to it. But it's not, um, it's not a breakfast substitute. No, it's no, it's no rusk with raisins in it. No muesli rusk. Just in case you are a new viewer, a rusk, of course, a South African food <laughs> that in most parts of the world would be considered a building material. It has the consistency of a cinder block and roughly the same taste. Hello, mobile Patty. 
That's very kind of you. You say you might have to send some care packages to Juma because of you can see that we're obviously desperately hungry trying to find bits and pieces to eat here in the drought. Well, Mobile Patty, yeah, it's been a tough dry season, hasn't it, Brian? Yeah. We're waiting for the spring so that we can eat a few fruits and maybe suck on a few flowers for the nectar. Hopefully but it, some berries. Maybe some berries, but they only come in the winter time, so we've got a long time to wait before we're going to see a berry again. Oh, Mobile Patty, it's really, it's really difficult. You can see how emaciated we are. All we've got is rusks. Not so, Brian. Paul, very good question. You say, why haven't we been to Cheetah Plains lately? We haven't seen ostrich or cheetah for a long time. Um, we have been, but there wasn't anything there the last time. The reason that we're all knocking about here today was obviously Karula is down at the south with Hayden, and we were really hoping to find those lions. There's a red-billed hornbill on the ground there. Yeah. And some elephants I can hear breaking sticks, eating zizzy for spark. We'll go and see if we can find them, everyone. While we do that, let's go and get an update from Brent and Herbert. Maybe they've got something more uh, useful to tell you about those lions than I've been able to. We're still looking for the lions. I think I've just heard four contact calls very close. We're just listening very carefully in that direction. There we go. I've heard them again. Sounds maybe 100 meters in front of us. So we're going to go really, really slowly. So we're in the area where we started out this morning. We've had tracks of them chasing things up and down all over the place. They chased zebra. Uh, we are between Gallagher Shortcut and Vubu Road and Gallagher Pass. They're chasing something. They're chasing something. I can just hear hooves. There, we've got them. We've got them. Okay, we've got them. There we go, Herb. There we go, Herbie. Come here, Dan. No, wait, no, I just want to call Jen. You see them? Yeah? Yeah. There we go, we've got them. One. Okay. So I'm just going to call Jen. You see them? Yeah? Come inside a bit. James, come straight onto Gallagher Shortcut. Um, we'll stand by for you here. We're just to the, the south of that second track that comes off the off the tow cut line. So there we go, we can see her. Just calling James. So we knew they were in the area, the tracks are all over the place. Okay, we don't want to scare them. So we're going to stay right here. And keep an eye on them. We just want to make sure that there aren't others around because there were contact calling, so they could have been spread while they were hunting. But it's often that your ears find animals before your eyes. So just that soft contact call is what gave her away to us. I'm just going to have to see if anyone's closer. Let's just move back a little bit, uh, just just so we can get a, there's a nice window we can see her from, just over here. 
And also, if we start retreating a little bit, it makes her feel a little bit safer. So if we come back to about, I'm just trying to find a good, uh, she's going to move. That's what I was worried about. That's why we're moving back. I mean, she's walking. She's not running. Oh, there we go. Okay. Well, she's moved off. I'm pretty sure the rest of the pride are there, and we don't want to pre put pressure on them. So what we're going to do is we're going to stay here, but I'm not going to go any closer. So lions on foot during the day, um, they are scared of us. We are the dominant diurnal predator during the day. So I don't want to chase them so the game drives can still find them. So, and also if we keep walking them, they might become aggressive with us, which is again what we don't want. So this is perfect success. We found the lions on foot. Now we get James and the other game drive vehicles in here. And so while we stand by here and wait for James to get here, we're going to go back to Hayden and Karula. So lions and leopards today. What an awesome way to start my morning. Shining upon us. So folks, what we're witnessing here is just uh, quite incredible. I've never seen two eternal enemies like this so relaxed. Karula has come down from the tree with her kill, rem remnants of her kill still up that tree. And now she's come down the tree and lying at the base of the tree whilst a hyena, an adult hyena, is only about five to seven meters away from her up the hill. It's quite an incredible thing to see. You don't see this very often. And just to give you an update, if you've just joined us, uh, we're sitting here with lion, um, sorry, leopard and, and uh, hyena, and I've got lion on my brain because I know the guys are on an incredibly exciting uh, little encounter with lion brent on foot and oh goodness me it's all happening this morning folks and you've got a little bit of uh, interaction no the left okay we're going to cross over to i'm not sure who it is but we've got something very exciting we'll be back people there are elephants herring across the road here we don't know what they're running from we're nowhere near where the lions are Unbelievable. Look at them all running, screaming at each other. Look at the dust. Let me move a little bit further forward. Now Brent has found those lions, of course, with Herbert. So we're going to continue, we're going to leave those elephants, they're obviously quite distressed by something, charging down Hyena Road there. You can hear them shouting. We're going to continue because obviously we want to try and get a good view of the lions. Are you going to stay with us, Becca, or do you want to go back to Hayden? I didn't know if we were doing a cameo link there. All right, let's pop back to Hayden. We're going to drive quickly towards Brent. How incredible was that? We had to do a really quick cut there. And these, this is what Safari Lives is all about, folks. You get those sorts of things. The animals actually are the, not the actors, but we live in this theater of nature here. So whatever happens, it happens as it happens. And we just have to sometimes do those little jump cuts to the really exciting stuff. But just as exciting on a different level, this unusual behavior right back here with Karula, this famous leopard, really sound asleep there. Obviously her senses are all very alert, uh, but looking like she's resting peacefully there and only seven meters away from her, eight meters, about 20, just over 20 feet away from her is a hyena an adult hyena doing the same thing as her. Incredible stuff. Over to my right and probably about 50 feet away from me is, I don't know if Shondra is going to be able to, he's going to have a crack at trying to see Shongile in there somewhere. There's a little, little spot you can just see, very, very difficult. Oh, it's so difficult to see, but Shongili is there, and Hosanna is up a little bit to the left of our frame there. So, 
we have a very interesting situation here. Um, flat cat, flat hyena, flat cubs. I think it sounds like the complete opposite to what's going on uh, around Brent Leo, Smith and James at the moment. Isn't it fantastic that we can just be around these animals in such a peaceful way? It's just incredible. So habituated. Sean's got a question and wants to know when leopards make their first kill. Well, it would be really interesting, Sean, that uh, we saw yesterday, or we, John Dre and I felt like we were at leopard school because we watched Karula teaching her cubs uh, how to climb up a tree and feed from the kill that she'd put up there. It was absolutely obvious that um, this is what she was doing. She had the kill in this little dry creek bed or, or drainage line yesterday. And she kept on covering that kill up with sand and dirt and leaves uh, to keep the, the scent down uh, from our, our special friends, the hyenas here. And she did that successfully for over 24 hours, probably 36. And the cubs came and fed back and forth, back and forth. When she knew the time to, to hoist it up the tree or to, to take it up there, haul it up, we don't know and we don't know what the trigger was, but she did it. And then she moved back over and covered up the scent that was left there on the ground. And then both the cubs took turns to ascend the tree, feed on the, on the carcass up the tree, and descend the tree. Then the other one went up. It was just incredible to watch. So she'll be constantly teaching them. I think by the time they get to probably a year, uh, they'll be starting to assist potentially. She may hold on to a kill uh, and allow them to come in and finish it off. Um, there's lots of different uh, external contributing factors to that. The pressure of maybe a hyena being very close by might change things, but she will gradually start to let them take over and teach them. And then, you know, 12 months to 15 months when they start to move off from her, um, they will have to be independent. And they will start on smaller, easier prey, and then they'll start to move up to the bigger, bigger prey animals. But um, it's a whole learning curve. They're picking up incredible skills from their mum at the moment. And uh, she's just looking up at us now. She's uh, a great, great mother. Just got another question from Spencer. And Spencer wants to know if uh, hyenas are always aggressive towards hyenas. Well. They definitely are. There's, there's a, the relationships between predators are quite intricate, but you know, hyenas rank just above uh, cheetah in the pecking order, but we still don't know why leopards allow um, hyenas to really take their kills and push them off kills as much as they do. And they do get quite unnerved uh, by hyena, that's for sure. Um, hyenas are certainly more powerful uh, and dangerous than uh, leopards, but the leopard can wait for weight be uh, very similar. So yeah, hyenas definitely uh, will be take any opportunity and advantage of uh, a leopard on a kill, and they definitely will have interactions that can be sometimes fatal. Um, but it's a really interesting thing to always see different behaviours like we are right now. And no matter what books say, and and uh, when you do study these animals, there's always exceptions to the rule, exactly like what we're seeing right now. Two eternal enemies, only about 20 feet from each other, both sleeping. Quite incredible. Thanks for your question, mate. When you do see a leopard lying like this on its side, you get such a beautiful, beautiful display of how that magical coat pattern is and that beautiful camouflage. But whilst we're with this flat Karula cat and the flat hyena, we might cross over to James and just get an update from him because there's got to be something interesting going on over there too. We'll be back with you just now.
Right, we've come into the area where Brent and Herbert found the lions. And Aubrey's there. I don't know if he's got visual. Let's just quickly ask him. Orbs, have you got visual there? Nothing yet. Okay. So they're walking through here and apparently they were contact calling. Now the elephants, as I've said to you many times, have made an unspeakable mess in this area. So it's quite difficult to drive off-road. But we'll see what we can find through here now. I know we say this often, but it's important. We do try and avoid hitting trees that we might actually seriously damage. Lots of them that we do drive over pop up afterwards. Some don't, but there are quite a few. And we avoid trees like the jackalberries and that sort of thing. Let's just stick our noses through here. Um, we won't sort of bash around too much in here while if we don't have the lions. But let's just have a quick look through here first. See if we can't find them. That herd of elephants we saw, by the way, everyone, had already crossed Central Road, so they'd run about a kilometre in less than a minute, so they're still going south. Don't know why they were so upset, what they were running from. Right, Brent, you reckon that they'd gone through here. I think let's head back to him, find out what his plans are for the short remainder of the drive. I'll see if we can get in here. So we've had a successful walk and let James get in there. So we've decided we're going to go ahead back towards quarantine. We're going to cut off into the block shortly. And let's go see if we can find some little things. We found a big thing. So now it's time to look for some trees, bugs. I'm still hoping for one wildflower with this green flush. Alas, not yet. I have seen a few kilanchos starting to show a bit of flower. So hopefully we do, we're able to find something. And Temperature is actually getting cooler, and I'm quite far, uh, happy we found the lions when we did because the wind's starting to pick up. And often, when you're walking and the wind's strong, you can give the lions a surprise, and we can give the lions a surprise, and the lions can give us a surprise. So it's quite nice now that the wind started to pick up. We found the lions while there was still no wind. We're able to hear that mm, 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 contact call put us into the right spot. So Herbie's just going to try help James explain to James where to go while we keep walking. Okay, and this is incredible. You can just see the decimation that the elephants have caused around here. And a lot of people call it elephant damage. Now, I don't call it elephant damage. I call it elephant activity. So as I said, we've been through a really wet couple of years, a really wet cycle. And so, a lot of these trees are no older than 10 or 15 years old. So it's actually good the elephants are pushing them down, especially on areas like we are now. This is a seep line, and this is actually the best grazing area. And we'll have a look. You can see lots of these small bushes have crept in during this really wet period. And what that does is it actually lowers the water table in the area. It stops the water being able to get down to the little river systems. And you can see even in the height of drought, often on these seep lines, there'll be more green than anywhere else. The soil here, let's see if we can actually show you, is what we call a duplex soil. And you can see it's very sandy on top, very fine sand, but depending, they're not normally too deep. Well, actually, you know what? I'm being silly. Let's go where to an elephant's done the hard work for me. <laughs> Much more sensible. Uh, been digging with my stick. Here we go. The elephant's done a bit of the hard work here, removing the roots. But you see, it doesn't take long for me to get down, and it changes from sand. It's much darker from down there. So if we take a sample from up top, and you can see it's lots of little bits of quartz, not so much quartz getting darker, and the quartz that's in this has fallen in. Let's just dig a little bit more. And you can see now it's getting hard. It's not sand. Oh, there we go. So, looking, look at that. 
that's clay. So it's a, what we call a duplex soil. So we've got sand as a nice big filter on top and then we've got clay that stops the water sinking too quickly. Now these areas during the rainy season can be very waterlogged, you don't drive over them and they're really good for grasses and then they attract animals like zebra, uh, wildebeest, impala and all the grazing species. Now Michael's wondering where did I get my stick? Michael, this is a perfect walking stick that I didn't even have to do any work on. I picked it up uh, on Rebecca, no, on Balanites Road. And it is a bush willow that is branch that has been broken by an elephant. And I did scrape a few bits of bark off it, but other than that, uh, it was an elephant. I am, however, worried about the, the crack that's forming. So what I might do is put some wire around it just to hold it together because I've become very attached to this stick since I picked it up. Okay, let's keep along here, see what other interesting things are about. Hi, Soraya and Dr. Rob. They're wondering, are there any natural uh, diseases or infections that can wipe out an elephant population or herd of elephants? There are a few. They're not very common. Uh, the one most common thing that wipes out elephants throughout Africa is drought, uh, lack of food. But in terms of a disease or, or whatnot, is anthrax. Especially when it's very dry, the anthrax falls in the sand, soil, the elephants kick it up, inhale that anthrax, and uh, you can have, a, depending on the area, I think, for example, Northern Botswana probably has two, th two to 3,000 anthrax deaths a year. It is not bad. It is a normal thing. It's one of the ways of controlling elephant population. So often those anthrax spores on the edge of water. Now, this is not too bad an anthrax area. They prefer the much drier climate. So if you go a bit further north than here, uh, anthrax is more common. That is why if, you, if you're not sure and you, about bones and dead things, don't touch them because you don't know if it's been anthrax. But while we keep moving our way through this block, looking for interesting things to find, let's go back to HT and the leopard cubs. Well, we've just seen Hassana come down from his little hidey hole and lay really close. He's only about, he's equidistant to his mum as she is to the, uh, to the hyena at the moment and he's got a very, very close eye on the hyena. Shongile is still lying down probably the same distance again away, so twice as far away. And everyone is very relaxed. The cubs are keeping their eyes on the hyena, but Karula is uh, definitely just lying there watching the hyena whilst the hyena watches her. It's quite incredible to see this this morning, folks. And just to go back on to the question that we got asked beforehand about when do the hyenas, I'm sorry, the leopard cubs start to kill for themselves. Um, I was sort of talking about the larger prey there, but uh, Jandre uh, gave me some info there, which is always fantastic to glean as much information we can from each other and also from you. All of you watching have know these, these leopards intimately. Um, so always you can help me out with information uh, that I might not be up to date on. Uh, but Jandre just gave me a great bit of information that they did witness um, Hassana take a little scrub hair uh, when he was about five months old. So you just like kittens, as, and as Jandre was saying, just like kittens, they, you know, they start to experiment. They'll just start to chase birds and experiment and start to hone their skills in hunting and then they'll move on to bigger and bigger prey. Uh, so really, really great to know that they're doing so well. Seven months of age, born on the 2nd of February, these two, and wow, it looks like um, a very confident mother and cubs at the moment in the presence of, as I always say, one of their eternal enemies, the hyena just lying up on the bank. But I love how camouflaged he is through there. You can hardly see him, there's little spots just on his ears there. 
those little black ears, he's just having a bit of a sniff of the air at the moment. Very difficult to see, but we're not going to move. You can just see the black tip of that ear. And very tricky to see. And that is a fantastic thing. Look at that. That was a great little full focus there that Jandre did to show you how difficult it is to see through any vegetation, this magical camouflage that they have. I mentioned it yesterday, uh, but I'll do it, just mention it again how tiny these guys are when they're born. You know, only anywhere from about sort of 14, 15 to 20 ounces in, in weight, which is about, I don't know, <laughs> Jandre knows that I'm not fantastic with my conversions, but around sort of 600 grams for people that are working in metric, 400 to 600 grams, it's about two to three oranges in your hand. And that's what they weigh when they're born. But now they're, uh, they're getting up there, they're getting great size and great strength and honing those wonderful life skills. It's going to make them uh, continue into big leopards into the future. Got a question from Justin S. And is it a good thing to show compassion for an injured animal in the bush? I mean, look, we as human beings, we have a tendency to always put human-like qualities onto animals, um, and we will always, you know, show compassion in the sense that it, you do feel sorry for an animal when it's injured or it's suffering. Of course, it's it's a really hard thing to watch sometimes. But it is the natural world, and it's happening happening perfectly. Perfectly. Uh, so we do see all different types of injuries, all different types of uh, of situations occurring with different species. That we have to just let nature take its course. We really do, and that's the way forward. I suppose when we've got an injury as a human, you know, you've got a bit of a limp. You feel sorry for your your mate or your your sister or your wife or your kid or whatever it may be. Um, but you know what, we get through it, and animals get through it sometimes as well. Uh, it's just sometimes the injuries can be, uh, have a detrimental effect on their existence, particularly when it comes to hunting, and we have it pretty easy as humans. We can go to the doctor, we can rest up, we can have our friends or family bring us food or look after us, whereas in the wild, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty tough out there. And as I said, some animals come back from it, uh, and some animals don't. But that is just absolutely how it's ha meant to happen. And uh, nature does, does get that exactly right. Great question, mate. Thank you very, very much for watching. So, Shongile and Hasana are now together, and Hasana has just gone over and laid with his sister. And he's the bigger of the two. I always get them mixed up, folks, because I've only this is the first time I've met these two. Um, but luckily, I've got the wonderful Chandre on the back there to uh, point out which one's which for me. Uh, Asana is on the left, and Shongile is on the right. Um, Asana is a male and a little bit bigger than his sister. But how cool are they? How beautiful are they? Without all the facts and the figures and the and the weights. It's just sometimes beautiful to sit with these animals and look at their complete perfection. So just whilst we're watching uh, the cubs there, lying down and just resting, and they're getting a little bit restless. Uh, they're wondering, they really want to come up to their mum and see their mum, I think, but uh, they know that they can't take that chance. Uh, Karula is just, just raising her head at the moment and looking around a little bit. And... 
The cubs are definitely getting a little restless. But the hyena is still asleep. Incredible to see this, uh, this behavior this morning. So many of the books say that the, the females will st start to stop uh, breeding around 16-ish, uh, 16 years of age. There's all different types of uh, statistics on that, but Karula is 12, so she's still got a fair few years left in her, and they will probably uh, breed one to three young in those sort of two year intervals. But she's an incredible mother. So what we might do is, we'll stay here. We are definitely uh, gonna stay right here and stick with these guys and we'll cross over to James and see what he's up to on this incredible line tracking. And uh, I don't know what they're up to, but I'm sure it's gonna be exciting. We'll see you just now. The lions have just been spotted again by Aubrey, everyone. They're moving around. We eventually came to check the old hyena den. Okay, copy orbs. Yeah, I'm right at the entrance of the old hyena den. I'm going to come along there and I'll come south from there. They're just in here, but it's very thick. Apparently, we're quite close. We can hear the You didn't use the term dulcet tones, though. So this is quite nice. Now they've been moving around contact calling the three of them, which may, perhaps they're looking for the fourth, and maybe the little cubs are with them. Hold on, Brian. Uh, one does feel a little shaken after these off-roading expeditions. Yeah, the babies are there. The babies are there. Okay, great stuff, thanks, Orbs. Um, shall I just come south? Um, I'm just going to give you a rev. Long time, mate. Long time. Very well, big man. Very well. Head on in, mate. Folks, um, we've just pulled out of that siding. Uh, we have been there for quite some time, and uh, we need to let some other people in. It's absolute imperative that we have good manners and uh, let some other people in to see that beautiful siding. So we're just going to go off and have a little tootle around, and we'll keep the Game Drive Channel uh, comms on and uh, see what the story is and then we might push back into there uh, as soon as we can. But it looked very quiet, it didn't look like there was anything going to happen very soon. They were both still asleep when we just walked, drove off then and uh, the cubs were both flat as well. So we'll just drive around and have a little bit of a, a toodle around and we might just uh, have a little scratch around here and see what we can find. Let's cross over to Brent and see what he's up to. I think he might be at a waterhole somewhere. We'll see you now now. So we're at Galago Pan. Now, this is where an age-old African drama played out last night. The Nkuhumas and Buffalo. This time, the Buffalo got away. But there's some fascinating tracks here. Now, if we... Well, we will stay here to teach you about the fascinating age-old battle, but in the meantime, it seems like James is caught up with those lions we found on foot. There's one lioness, everybody. We just had a wonderful view of the five cubs 
just walking through here. Aubrey managed to find them. He's way over there, the other side of the drainage, and he couldn't get this side, but he could see them. So he guided us in here, and we will now follow them. They're all gone down to sleep here. Orbs reckons maybe these lionesses are going to go and try and hunt now, and they're trying to find a place to stash the cubs. And it doesn't look like they ate last night. They definitely didn't kill a big buffalo last night, so I think that's probably quite a good guess from Aubrey as to what's going on. We'll try and get in there now. Lots of very thick bush here, I'm afraid. Wonderful. Finally, I feel that's just reward. what's going on and we'll stop here and have a look. Look at the little ones playing there. Orbs looks like they're heading towards the drainage. Look at that. Look. Isn't that fantastic? Oh, they're so beautiful. Yeah, copy that. Aubrey reckons if we lose them through here, it's going to be impossible to follow them. But we'll keep trying. Isn't that brilliant? Mm. All the little cubs. Oh, they're my favorite lion cubs. Okay, we're going to move again. They may go towards Gallagher Water. Yee. There's some very thick stuff in here. Well, there's one lioness. We can at least look at her. this looking at us as if to say what on earth are you doing you can see definitely haven't eaten yesterday despite their efforts with that buffalo so somewhere in these bushes everyone is a buffalo that has got some very nasty lion scrape marks all the way down its flanks a horrible bite on the spine And you see how quickly she got up, how incredibly athletic she was. All right, we're going to keep see if, seeing if we can find another view or a way through the drainage. In the meantime, let's go to Brent. He's got something interesting to show you. So as we're saying, that age-old battle that's been happening in the African bush, lion versus buffalo, last night the buffalo escaped. But we've got some fascinating tracks. I've just heard the lions might be coming back towards where we are. So we're going to have a look at the tracks quite quickly and then we're going to move along. So if we have a look here, there's these incredible drags all along the ground. And if we come carefully and look at the end of the drags, like this, so this is a lioness who's been on the back of a buffalo. So her front legs are on the back of the buffalo and her back legs are just being dragged around. Look at this, being dragged around by the buffalo as they try to bring it down. There's buffalo drag marks all around here. We're trying to find some blood as well. Now, it was after the end of safari yesterday, but luckily enough, Vim, who is behind the camera today, heard it from his bedroom and uh, actually got everyone to rush out here. It's just amazing, the strength of that buffalo dragging lions around. But of course, as we said, the lions are on the way here. They are still quite far. But we're not going to stop them and deny them a drink. So let's move on. Now we've got to be quite careful while walking in this area because there is that buffalo who has had a hard time and uh, got ripped quite badly by the lions. So we're just going to go very slowly through here. Also, I want to pick up my camera trap, which is on this path. So possibly we have lions on lion and buffalo hunting. 
Right, while we go make our way out of here, give the lions a chance to come drink if they want to, let's go back to James with Little Lions. We found them again, everybody. They're just disappearing down into this drainage line. Oh, wonderful sighting. I've walked through here. It's beautiful to walk through. I'm very glad I didn't find any lionesses with their cubs. Just trying to see now if they're going to go up the other side. I mean, we can drive parallel. Let's see what happens. <laughs> it's just, it's such a lovely part of the reserve, which unfortunately you kind of need a magic carpet to go through because lots of bush. Uh, or you can be on foot, of course, but you can't really view lion cubs on foot. Their mummies get very cross. Watch out there, Brian. Watch your heads, everybody. <clears throat> we'll keep trying parallel with the drainage line here. I don't think we'll be able to get across it. In fact, I'm 99%. Oh, there we go. One lioness in front of us. Let's see what she does. I can hear the cubs. Listen carefully. Just here. I wonder if they're not going to leave them in the drainage here. Do you hear that? <laughs> there they are. Just to the left of where we are now. They're still moving with the pride. Just, you can just see them moving there. Now, I think that one of them gave birth in this very complicated set of drainage systems, and I think that's why we didn't see them for some time. And then they're going back into the drainage there. It's almost as if this one lioness is staying this side because we here, I don't think she's nervous of us. But it's such a pleasure to watch lions moving in the light. Isn't it just great? She'll get up and move now. I'm not going to move until she does, I don't think. We'll just give her a bit of time, mainly because I'm not sure how much further we can go. In fact, hang on. I think if we go straight and they can t follow with the line of the drainage, we might actually get them coming the other side. Let's see if we're lucky. Oh, no, they're coming out there. They're coming out, aren't they? I can see little ears behind her. See them there, Brian? Um, let me sneak forward. Yes, there's another lioness, or one of the cubs there. We might be in luck here, everybody, and it will be very lucky indeed. Hold on. Uh. There we are. Just see the one lioness there, she's now moving. And the rest of them are going down into the drainage. They are in front of us, I can just see them there. You see they're in front of us, Brian. You can just see a little bit of lion through there. They might just wait here. Let's sit for a little bit. That's one of the mothers there. As you can see, she's lactating still. I'm quite pleased to see her moving in that direction. It means the others might come out. The cubs are right in front of us. I'm going to try one more maneuver forward, everybody. It's going to be a little bit crunchy. <laughs> I 
a little bit crunchy. Be careful of the trees we run over here. just behind this little bunch of thickets here. Here we go. You got them there, Brian? You did have before I put you behind a bush. Yeah, I'm going to back up a little bit, and then we'll get a view. Oh, no. How's that, Brian? Is that at all useful? That's all we got at the moment, everyone. Let's see if anything changes. Those cubbies might come out here. Just hear them. Oh, there's the other one. <laughs> That's slowly settling down for the day, I think, perhaps. Now, who's who in the zoo here? We've got these three lionesses. We've got the other one that went off to the north, lactating. Did you see how many cubs we had, Brian? No. Pretty I didn't sure either. Three. I was pretty sure it was three as well. So the other two are possibly have been possibly stashed somewhere around here. Maybe that other lioness is going to fetch them or to feed them. I'm just going to call Aubrey quickly. Safari Hayes, very good question from you about where the other lioness is denning and do we know? We don't know Safari Hayes. We have no idea where she is at the moment. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if she was somewhere in this very complicated sort of network of drainage systems here. Go ahead, Orbs. Yeah, Aubrey, I am um, sorry. <laughs> uh, is this, hang on, hidden out. I'm going to answer your question now. Orbs, we have got them. They are a lot parallel with the drainage. Now they've just come back to the eastern side, so we've got a view of them here, about 200 meters south of where I last saw you. It's amber eyes in front of us. Orbs have now turned around on their mo mobile north again. So, the question was, where are the Birmingham boys? Don't know at the moment. Were tracks around Buffles Hook Dam today and around Cheetah Cut Line for one male? Amber Eyes was consorting with one of them the other day. But obviously she's either pregnant or she's come out of estrus. There are the cubs. Brian, they're just in the thicket to the left of us, to the right of us. You can just see them. There we go. So I don't know where the other three Birmingham's were. We heard one calling this morning way to the south. I'm just going to find out from Aubrey if he wants to try and make his way here. Here comes another lioness. Was that the same one? Was one? Oh, with the cubs. Orbs, do you want to come back in here? Look. Look. Mm. 
there. Um, orbs. Yeah, they've turned north now. Look at them running. Vanessa, nice one from you about when they know, how they know to stay still <coughs> when they go hunting. Um, well, Vanessa, I'm not entirely sure exactly what the signal is that's given. I think it's a bit of a, a, a growl. And they'll find a place like this drainage line to leave them. And then they do stay dead still, dead quiet. Until they get a little bit older than this and then they play. They get a bit naughty. You know, like when you leave a kid, you tell it not to do something. They get a little bit naughty. Let's try and move and see if we can't get another view. I think we might. I mean, that's the direction we've just come from. So we should be lucky there. That was well worth all the body. Going, of course. Ah, I'm not in low range. That'll be why. They're lying down there. Brian can see them lying down there. Hello, Justin. Um, you're wondering if they're going to try and keep hunting the buffalo. I don't think the same buffalo, Justin. I think they gave up on that thing yesterday evening. I think it, he, he managed to outlast them. They became so exhausted by the efforts that they eventually gave up and left him alone. Oh, this is nice. I don't know where the other two have gone. We've got the lioness here with the three cubs. I think the other two must be up here. I mean the other two cubs. With that first lioness who went off to the north. Let's just move my way out the way. They're looking a little bit skinny, but they always do, you know, if they haven't just eaten. There's a little pom-pom starting to develop there on the end of the tail. Dawn, I'm going to ask you to answer your own question. Um, well, or try and think about it. You say, why do they have a black tail tip? Just look at that picture that you're looking at now and tell me what are the two most obvious features of the lions that you can see. They're calling. Can you see the, that very obvious black color on the back of the ears of the cubs and the mother? Now it's the same reason that the black tail tip is that color. It's a following mechanism, we think. And even though there are two colors that are other than sort of luminous yellow and luminous pink that are not common out here, plain black and plain white are two colors that you do not find often here. But the other two cubs there. One, two, just the three. Mm. The other two. That's, I, I'm just reticent to get, you know, to move too much and then I'm past us, but let's try. I don't really know how to answer this next one. Safari Hayes, you say, does it seem that they are dropping their cubs in separate locations strategically? That's certainly possible. I don't see why they wouldn't spread the risk, as it were. Yeah, so they could well, Safari Hayes.
heavily lactating, you can see. Isn't that calling? up and down here. I wonder if they're not looking for the other two. I hate to say this, but maybe some tragedy has befallen. I mean, they're going up and down the same area. Look. Mika, you're wondering about male lions and whether each pride needs to have a male to dominate the pride. No, they don't. Mika, what happens is, well, I mean, essentially, yes, every pride has got a coalition or one male lion that sort of is dominant in the territory in which they live. But they don't live with the pride and they are often, they are often um, dominant over two or three pride territories. So you won't often see them with the males, unless they're at a kill site. Orbs, go ahead. Last little cup here. They did, but then they came back, Orbs. Now they seem to be crossing again in an easterly direction. They've just got up now. Poor Aubrey is trying to decide which side of this drainage line to come, and he's decided to come back around to our side, and now they're, <laughs> they're disappearing in here. Yeah, Andrew, if they cross east here, you won't see them. I think it'll be almost impossible to get them. Yes, we won't be able to cross here, I don't think. Brian, do you? Uh, we can try, but... Hmm. Well, it might be the last thing we do. All right, I'm going to consider what to do here, everybody. We've just got them moving down through there. While we do that, let's go across to Brent and find out what he's doing. So we've just been speaking about age-old battles, uh, possibly not quite as dramatic as the lion versus buffalo, is the elephant versus marula. Now we're here with a particularly large marula out in an open area, and it has been completely debarked by elephants. And that has actually sealed this marula's death, so to speak. Now if we have a look carefully, you can see here we're onto the core part of the wood. It's nice and smooth. But a little bit across, we see there's this little raised section. Now, this is the area that the elephants are actually out of after. It's called the cambium layer. But now, this takes nutrients all the way up. But see, wherever we go, that nutrient layer just can't get to the next nutrient layer at the top of the tree. So if we go down to one of these low ones, and I take my stick, and I bash it, you can see it's green, it's wet, uh, it's bringing up moisture and nutrients, trying to get it to the rest of the tree. But the elephants have stopped the root. Now this is the most fresh part of feeding on here. If we sneak a bit further around, and the, this is how the marula tree is actually going to die, because there's often little spots where the nutrients can get up, uh, but this one's not the case. So now this has been fed on earlier, and you can see it's drier, and there's a little piece of cambium. And you can see it's not that green. There's still some moisture in it, but it's not green anymore. So that's slowly losing that nutrient. Now, once it starts drying like this, the real killer of the marula tree is the wood borer beetles, the longhorn beetles. And it needs to be dry before they can drill in here and start feeding. And if we come have a look, there's one tiny, tiny little wood borer who's managed to get in so far. So that's obviously the driest point of the tree. And uh, that is the beginning of the end. So as this section dries out, more and more wood borer beetles are going to start eating into here. 
and what will normally happen then it'll actually just cause the tree to collapse even though the top half of the tree might be alive for quite a lot longer um, with the wood borer beetles it's going to cause this tree to fall over but it's it's sad but it's it's also nature and it is just incredible to watch i really love the patterns that are created around here not only the patterns on the tree the patterns of all the bark and branches that have been scattered by the ellies it is an absolutely fascinating sort of area to spend time if you stop stop and look a little bit closer as you can see the wind has picked up incredibly and that's one of the reasons we're on quarantine and uh, while walking the probably the most dangerous thing we face apart from darkness is wind I'm trying to stick in nice, safe, open areas. I'm not going to be surprised by elephant or buffalo or hippo or lions. But uh, I'm happy we managed to find those lions before the wind picked up in that thick bush. But you don't really want to be walking around in the thick bush. Well, hi, Mika. Mika's wondering, are there any endemic or invasive plants in the Saabi Sands? The Sabi sands, they're not really any specialized endemics that only occur here. They occur throughout the low fold biome. We have some trees that are rarer than the others, uh, like sneeze woods and saffrons. Uh, in terms of evasive plants, unfortunately there are a few. Uh, one of the worst, uh, in my opinion, is red star zeno, which is a flower. And if you get a lot of rain, this whole area is covered in them. Uh, there's the odd prickly pear. Uh, Lantana, which is a uh, Camara, which is another exotic from South America. Uh, but there are programs to eradicate those exotic plants. But in terms of endemics, not too many. Now, here we go. I'm not going to touch this with my hand. And you can see that is hyena dung. And from all the bones they eat, the calcium, when their dung dries, it goes white, white, white like powder. Beetles. Oh, they're beetles. Them spotted carrion beetles. Very cool. Oh, look at that. So, I think that's a beetle carapace. Oh no, they, they, they have died um, while, uh, <laughs> how are we going to put this delicately? While making the next generation. Now, if we look over here, it looks like they've actually laid eggs inside. So, they've burrowed into the, the hyena feces, these carrion beetles, and they've laid their eggs. And you can actually see where uh, the next generation has popped out. So there's a couple of dead ones around here, but they managed to procreate before expiring. Very cool. Well spotted, Liam. Okay, let's keep open on the open areas. We heard a big herd of elephants around here, so I'm just keeping my eyes open. Hopefully they don't uh, come through here, but also I'm walking straight into the wind. Now that'll give me a chance to smell buffalo or elephant and hear them. Uh, and hearing is very, your hearing is very much compromised in the wind, but it also won't let them smell us first. And we've got a nice big safe open area behind us, safe open in front of us. Uh, we're going to just keep moving through here and seeing what else we can find. So while we keep moving and keep watching out for elephants, uh, let's go back to uh, Karula and HT. Well, there's been loads of action on Safari Live this morning, hasn't it been fantastic, hey? With Brent and James, what they've been doing on the other side there. And we've had loads of action here with our beautiful Queen of Juma. Yep, she's rolled over. <laughs> she's repositioned herself. It's just the most extraordinary bit of behaviour we're watching this morning. One of her eternal enemies or leopards eternal enemies as I've used the term many times before the hyena uh, always associated with uh, eventually associated with a leopard and its kill uh, and you've got Karula lying down about 20-25 feet away from her completely stretched out both knowing from each other that they're avoiding confrontation. For what reason, we don't know. Uh, the hyena had no intention of getting up and running towards Karula as she came down out of the tree. And uh, Karula had no intention of going any closer to her. So it's it's not... Look, we sat here with uh, Taxon uh, from Juma, what an amazing guide, and... Uh, 
and Andrew from Cheetah Plains a second ago, and they both said that they'd never seen this before in all their all their time here in the bush. <coughs> Excuse me. So it is quite an extraordinary uh, encounter this morning. It might look a little bit quiet, but it is still wonderful to sit with. And I don't think we just moved off before because we wanted to make sure that uh, other people had the opportunity to come and see this as well. And we've just come back now. The uh, the morning sun is starting to break through the cloud, and we are still sitting here with Karula and this hyena. Now the cubs are well away from here, probably twice the distance away from the the hyena lying down in a safe spot with a quite a good vantage point where they can see uh, the hyena but there's just no movement at the moment everyone's relaxed it will change of course it will change and that's why we want to sit around here and wait but obviously having uh, manners for other people that uh, would like to come and see this as well so really interesting behavior this morning yesterday just to give you the bit of the backstory firstly uh, let me say this, if you are a new viewer to Safari Live, welcome. Uh, it's great to have you on board and ov obviously for our regular safari safarians, um, brilliant to have you always. Yesterday we went to leopard school. Uh, Karula killed that impala about 36 hours ago and did some beautiful behavior down there teaching the cubs, oh, letting the cubs eat, covering the scent. Uh, protecting her youngsters and it was just down in this drainage line that uh, Jandre's panning around to see down there it doesn't really look much but just down to the left of Karula was a uh, was a carcass now it's in the tree right up in this tree that we're panning up to now it's just hanging in there it's a little bit tricky to see um, but that's the remnants of the the impala up there now she hauled it up the tree and that was pretty fantastic to watch as well always the strength of a leopard hauling a, a carcass up a tree and then she placed it she really wedged it into this tambuti tree and got it in there so it wasn't going to fall out and as she helped down she went back over to where the carcass was and she started to cover up the scent of that carcass the where it, the position that it was in and she was really obviously doing that covering the the area with leaves and dirt to hide that scent and give her a little extra time uh, for her cubs to uh, get up into that tree safely and then we watched Hasana the f male climb up the tree and start to eat uh, the kill ah oh, sorry the the carcass he had his fill he went down uh, Shongile then carried on up and had her turn and then they both came down and we left them just on dusk uh, to make sure we got out of there at a good time for them for their safety and they gave us an incredible afternoon so we went to leopard school yesterday which was brilliant and now we've come back today to this extraordinary situation where we came and arrived we saw the the, the hyena and we then saw Karula descend from the tree, lie down at the base of the tree. The hyena did not even flinch, and that's where we are at now, folks. I think we've got a, a question from, is it Christy? Just let me confirm the, the name. We've just got another vehicle arriving. Okay, we've just got another vehicle arriving to enjoy this signing with us, folks. Um, Carol Christie uh, has just asked us uh, why the hyena is not calling its family. Well, hyenas sometimes will uh, live a bit of a solitary uh, time. That we don't know what the situation or what the social situation for this particular hyena is. Sometimes they can roam the, the bush in a solitary uh, fashion for quite some time and then come up uh, join a clan or go back to their clan very very um, loose movements we're not sure if it's a male or female Jandre you think it's a potentially a female do you um, so we're not really sure but if it is a female we don't know where where she is in uh, her life in her social structure so she may have picked up this scent we've had a, a regular group of, or clan of uh, hyena here for some time and they moved off Jandre how long ago 
about a month ago, John Dre is telling me they moved back uh, or moved away. But we have sort of transient individuals come through, uh, and that's that's probably what we think um, we think is happening here. So whilst we've got these this flat cat and uh, the flat hyena and the cubs, we're going to cross back over to Brent and get a bit of an update. We'll see you just now. So we've found a tree that is a little bit further down the line than the last marula tree we looked at. So if we have a look here, you can see that's that cambium layer I was talking about earlier. And when I was touching it, we were getting a little bit of greenery or moisture. And now there's nothing. It is completely dry, no moisture. And you can see there's almost not much left of the tree. And you can see massive wood borer beetles, giant longhorn beetle holes all in here where they've burrowed in so it's probably not the safest spot to be standing on a windy day but so that basically compromises the whole interior of this marula tree and then one of my favorite little designs that you, you don't see too often uh, outside of trees that have been eaten is when you've got the smaller wood borers that aren't quite strong enough while they look for a spot to dig into they make these incredible patterns on the wood. Look at that. And that's absolutely spectacular. It's so delicate. Oh, very, very nice. But of course, like when anything dies out here, it provides food for lots of different things. And you can see termites have been here. You can see there's actually something's knocked off. This is where termites were. And they might be even in the center using those holes made by the wood borer beetles to get right into the heart of the tree. Now we look down at the, at the base here, you can see it's a disused one, so they, they've moved away from here. But this was I mean, incredible how they're able to stick individual grains of sand together uh, to be able to form a protective layer from the sun on the outside. And they've eaten what they wanted to. I think they've come for the cambium layer. And this pith in the center of the wood is not really appealing to them too much. But of course, in this sort of absolute it almost looks like a war zone around it, uh, where all the branches have fallen, termites have eaten them, termites have come and eaten and then left the parts they don't want and the wood board borer beetles are going to eat that. Let's just see what happens if we break open one of these. We might find scorpions, spiders. Let's give it a good kick. And you can see the termites have eaten, to a degree, the parts they want. Okay, so you can look at that. So what's happened is the wood borer beetles have let them have access into the center part, into the core. And the wood borer beetles have eaten what they want. The termites have come in next and basically just cleaned it out and only left the part that they find unpalatable. And this isn't that incredible. Nothing goes to waste out here. And I'm quite sure during the next uh, summer season, something will come back and eat what's remaining of this wood. Amazing. Now... If we go even further along, we've gone from one degree to the next degree, and we're going to go to pretty much the final degree. And it's not too far away, and it won't take very long either. And this process will happen in a year or two. So Vim's going to show you what the tree looks like, and next to it's a healthy marula. That's what it would look like if it had its cambium layer and its bark. making sure no elephants sneak up on us. Now this is not a marula. <laughs> this looks like a knob thorn, so the wood's a bit harder. But in a, in a two years, three years, this is basically all that's going to be left um, of a tree. Now this is wood's a bit harder than the, than the marula, so there's a bit more left. And as if it was a marula, there would probably be nothing left there. Well, you can see Herbie behind me is looking for scorpions and hohos for stuff for me. Now, a branch like this is a great place to have a look underneath. Can we see anything, ma'am? Not yet. Oh, this is an ideal spot for spiders. I mean, let's turn this over a bit and we can see a bit more underneath, and then we'll put it back in the same spot. 
Can you see anything? Oh, there, oh, there we go. Let me just turn it all up. Let me just find a spot to balance. There we go. Oh, we found something. It is a, a violin spider. You see, it's a very big one. You see those little dots on the joints on the leg? Now, this is one of the most venomous spiders we get. Now, they are very shy and retiring. Oh, there's the egg sac as well, up above. A very, very shy and retiring spider species. They're very difficult to be bitten by, but if they do bite you, they cause massive necrosis. And necrosis, obviously, your cells die around the bite site and become very, very infected. All right, we're not going to... This is a nice, perfect spot for a violin spider in the dark, away from light. Uh, they might catch all sorts of little tiny microscopic insects that might burrow around and move through. Oh, we have spotted something else. Now, that is another spider. It looks like it could be related. No, it's not a jumping spider. Oh, even more quite scary looking. Almost like a mole spider, almost, that long body. Oh, and also, obviously, a fan of the dark. It's coming out again. Oh, well, well spotted, Jim. I'm going to have to go have a look what that one might be in the book. I, don't, I haven't seen, I've seen spiders similar to that, but it almost looks like he's built to go underground. Anyway, let's put this back. There we go, back to where it was. So while we continue to see what we can find on quarantine, uh, let's go see what Commander Bond is up to. We found some birds, everybody, some red-billed buffalo weavers. There they are. And suddenly there's a cold wind blowing. That's a really nice shot of a red-billed buffalo weaver. Also a very good way to warm up the voice, a red-billed buffalo weaver. And they're ostensibly seed eaters. Quite a few birds we've seen around these um, clearings. Hello Kyle, you're a new viewer. Wonderful to have you with us. Please tell us where you're from and thank you for talking to us. You want to know how long this live stream will last? Well this particular live stream will last another 18 minutes or so and then we'll be done and then we'll start again this afternoon at 3 o'clock Central African time and we'll go through to 6 o'clock. So it's 6 hours a day, three or oh, 3 hours twice a day. 6 hours a day in total, that is, Brian, you know that? 3 times 2, mm -hmm. well done. Uh, basically surrounded by the crepuscular activities of the animals, so around sunset and around sunrise, for 3 hours around those 2 times of day. And please do talk to us. Well, obviously you are talking to us, but for anybody else who perhaps a new viewer, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter if you want to talk. And questions at wildearth.tv. Your questions, unbelievably, will come through to us as we are looking at these animals. So that's a red-billed buffalo weaver, and if you wanted to know about it, you could just type in a question. For example, uh, what is that red-billed buffalo weaver eating? Hashtag Safari Live. And Rebecca in the final control will read it into my ear and I will then answer it and that entire process will take an astonishingly short period. And in the background you can hear the magpie shrikes calling. And the virtual starling. The way they hop. Next time you go outside, everybody, I want you to try and hop across the garden or your patio, or wherever it is, or do it in the living room if you like. It's not easy. This bird is moving with remarkable speed and agility, and we kind of watch, I say this a lot, but we watch birds move and we just kind of, I think, pass them off. That walking's not so impressive, we're capable of that. But just watch when it starts to hop more than its own body length when it goes, incredibly fast. The accuracy with which that bill is picking up, possibly ants, I think actually that's what it's going for, probably little ants on the floor. Oh, 
Walking looks almost awkward. And the tiny little brain, probably no more or no bigger than the size of a relatively average peanut, is somehow conspiring to instruct that bird's body what to do. It's processing the information it's seeing, a, an ant deciding that is something good to eat, telling the beak to, or the muscles surrounding the beak to head down to the ground, accurately pick it up and then swallow it and then do it all again, all within a space of a microsecond. It's, it's truly unbelievable. The number of processes involved going through that tiny little peanut-sized brain just for it to pick up one ant are, are incredible. Well, I think they are. Do you think they are, Brian? I think it's phenomenal. Uh, thank you. Thank you for supporting me there. Um, the other thing we must bear in mind, of course, at this stage is that I no longer have brakes. I think I tore the brake line out trying to find those lions, and so we have to slow down using the gearbox. Uh, luckily, this isn't a particularly sloped area. Birchall's Kukul, not Kukul, Birchall's Starling. Jody, you want to know about the Birchall's Kukul and when it comes back. Um, it doesn't go anywhere, but Jody, they're just not very common here. They're more common on the in the wetter parts of the Sabi Sands. The Birchall's Kukul, everyone, a large brown, black and white bird that goes <coughs> known as the rain bird. And this is the Birchall's Kukul, named for the same Swedish naturalist. No, he wasn't Swedish, he was English. William Birchall, if I'm not mistaken, met his end at the uh, horns of a buffalo, I think. One of them did. He has four birds named after him. The Birchall's Kukul, the Birchall's Starling, the Birchall's Corsa, and the Birchall's... What's the other one? Sand grouse. Not coarser. There's a sand grouse, a starling, a cuckoo. Please will somebody find out what it is for me? Sand grouse, starling, sand grouse, starling, cuckoo, birchels. Is there a virtual Corsa? There's a... Sorry everyone, I'm going to go mad if I don't do this. Bird app, birds, search, bird guide, b, virtual. Corsa, Kukul, oh there's a Corsa, I was correct. Phew, I thought I was going mad. Corsa, Kukul, sand grass, starling. Hurrah! Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah! Now, other news on the wire was that we think, uh, or there was some news that Shadow may have crossed onto Voyatella, which is Juma basically, from Arethusa not too long ago towards Impala Plain. So we'll just do a drive down there and see if we don't pick her up. I don't mean pick her up literally, of course, we don't want to pick her up. That would be uncomfortable for Brian in the back. There's not really enough space for both of them. Sally, you're worried that the virtual starling is not in your book and perhaps worrying about the quality of your book or if you're not hearing it right. Uh, you're not hearing it right, Sally. It's my, uh, it's probably the wind in my poor pronunciation. It's Birchell, B-U-R-C-H-E-L-L, Birchell. And he was, a, like I say, a British naturalist called William Birchell, who, like many of his ilk, were knocking about this area in the 19th century. And he had four birds named for him. He named the zebra that we see here, the Birchall zebra. He had that named for him. He had the, um, no, the Wahlberg, the fruit bat named after him. Anyway, and I don't remember exactly how he died, but I think, I think it was in Botswana. One of them died in Botswana while trying to hunt a buffalo. 
And Sally, I'm sure you'll find the virtual starling in your book, as opposed to the virtual starling, which you will not. And if you do find the virtual anything in your bird book, throw it away. Oh, there's a nasty wind blowing up from the southeast. Jenny Hoggs, you say, have I ever um, eaten leaves that have been scent marked before? Um, Jenny, uh, I'd love to tell you, yes, I have, and they tasted just like the buttered popcorn they smell like, but no, I haven't ever managed to eat any leaves that have been scent marked, as far as I'm aware. I think you'll find that it's highly likely I have sampled uh, leaves that have been scent marked, but as you can see, Brian, They've do me none harm at all. None harm has done it me, can it solve. Yes. Exactly what you said. We're going to leave you now, everybody. Hand you over to Brent. Thank you for joining us on our drive. Uh, the minimalist Thai thumb says goodbye to. We will see you this afternoon at 3 o'clock. Until then, stay safe and happy. Bye-bye. So I'm with a tree that's been pushed over by an elephant, but I am literally in our car park. So VM actually watched it into the roof and then tried to feed it and looked at it and went, mm mm, that's not going to work. So I pushed it off away. So the elephants are really coming to camp at the moment, so we're going to show you. So you can see, there we go. Maggie the Mahindra. And uh, it was a vehicle we haven't seen in a long time. It's Jigia. Back from the uh, hospital, and hopefully he'll be up and running shortly. And uh, this is where Wendy sleeps, and this is where Rusty sleeps, and this is very fresh elephant duck. Now, they've literally been in this tiny between the house, uh, where the DRC, where everyone stays. And this was, oh, what time last night, VM? Uh, 5.30. 5.30 in the evening. Yeah, so 5.30 in the evening, there were Ellie's all over here. And uh, there we go. So feeding, feeding, feeding. You can see they are absolutely smacking all the trees. So you can see how they've been feeding. And you can see that's where everyone lives behind there. Mike in uh, New York City. Uh, welcome, Mike, to the end of the bushwalk, but I'm sure you've been with us from before. Mike's wondering why uh, are elephant females in charge and with lions, the males are in charge. Well, Mike, elephant females are not truly in charge. They're in charge of that little female group. An elephant bull, like a male lion, is so big and so strong that if he is there, he is the dominant. They will argue and fight, as will lionesses with male lions, but uh, Male lions, male elephants, they are the bosses of those herds. There's only one truly matriarchal society out here in the African bush, and that is the spotted hyena. Uh, we keep seeing, you can see how the elephants have rearranged everything here. This weeping wattle is completely gone. And uh, hopefully uh, it'll be food for the bushbuck and the nyala. So sad. Hi, Michael. Michael's 18 year old. Do elephant cows ever challenge the matriarch uh, for dominance like in other animals? Not really, Michael. So, so what happens is generally old age uh, that matriarchal step down and one of the young cows will step forward. Only really a so there's no obvious challenge for the matriarchal position. If they She's far more fighting for those. Really, really apologize about that signal loss, everyone. Uh, as most of you, your regular safarians, you know that we do come across that now and again for. Uh, new time safarians on Safari Live. We do get a little bit of a signal drop out now and again when we get into these little dips and particularly on bushwalk. So I do apologize and thank you for your patience on that.
we have been with these guys for a few hours now. We've moved in and out to let other people come in. But the most extraordinary uh, hyena leopard interaction that I've seen in a long time. We've asked a lot of the guides that have come through here and people, Jandre, he's uh, mentioned as well, never seen it before. The relaxed nature of Karula the leopard with this hyena, only 20 feet from each other. She has just moved down into the drainage line just below us here. Uh, it's a very tricky bit of country for us to film in, but it's still fantastic uh, to be around and to show you lots of uh, difficult spots for Jandre to get good pictures. But, you know, he's done an amazing job to, to pull this together this morning, where the location we're in. She just moved down out of the sunshine uh, when it was out and laid down in a cooler spot. But she's asleep down there, and only about 20 feet above her on the bank is a hyena that was sitting underneath the tree with her this morning, waiting for her to drop part of the carcass out of the tree. Meanwhile, her cubs are about oh, probably twice that distance again away from her and uh, the hyena, and they were making their move up to their mum, but they still haven't got the, quite got the confidence to go up to her at the moment being quite wary that they don't want the hyena to uh, see them or detect them. Uh, so they're, they're really keen to get to their mum, but they can't actually do it at the moment. So they've been lying out, keeping a, a close eye over what's going on, and it's been great for us to see it. But sheer brilliance in her her raising of these cubs and what, what she's done with them. And I'd just like to give a big shout out as well from all of us here at Safari Live for South African Women's Day today. Karul is an amazing female. She's done amazing things in her 12 years on the planet and I'm sure there's an incredible amount of amazing uh, women here in South Africa today celebrating that, uh, that national day. So big hats off to you and a big shout out from all of us here at Safari Live. We had, we've had this situation this morning, the cubs have been like looking fantastic and Jandre's got these beautiful pictures and then just as we've gone, come back to you, the cubs have walked off. And that's what's great about filming wildlife, you know, you just can't predict these things. When you get easy shots, it's easy, but when you don't, you've really got to work for it and uh, we've still got a beautiful picture here of uh, Karula chilled out down there. I might just roll back and uh, start up and just show you the proximity of Karula, the, the uh, hyena, just to finish on. And we're just getting a little bit of a tricky spot here, so we'll just maneuver. Bit of a bump coming up, folks, so hold on. Now, if Chandre can maybe, is that good enough for you, mate? can't really see Karula that well, but she is lying down there in the drainage line behind the, that little bit of vegetation. And then just above, up the hill from her, is the hyena. See there at the top of the screen? How incredible is that? Both asleep, both only 20 feet, 6, 7 metres away from each other. And we've had an incredible, incredible time seeing them this morning. We thought that there was a bit more action going to happen, but at the same time, <coughs> excuse me, I'm glad not too much action's happening. Oh, look what I've just spotted now. Hold on, folks. Just hold on. base of the tree and I think the other one's going to come up and try and chase it now. So they're getting a little bit uh, active just at the base of the tree there sticking his head around the tree. I think you can see him there just there. I think his sister went up the tree and uh, it's really tricky to see folks because it's so thick in there but we do see two beautiful healthy cubs. And I just want to thank you all for watching this morning and watching these beautiful interactions and from all of the guys and the whole team, everyone in final control. Um, here she goes, is it she? I can't quite see who's who. It's her going up the tree, it's really difficult, but they are both playing in the tree there. 
I just want to thank everyone for being with us this morning and particularly uh, the first hour which we were doing a school special to just under a, th a thousand children in uh, schools in New South Wales, Australia, which was a brilliant thing in collaboration with Taronga Zoo, uh, whereas where I'm working now. Folks, thank you very, very much for being with us. We look forward to having you on board this afternoon with us at the same time for our afternoon, our sunset drive. And from Jandre and I and all the team, thanks again. You've been watching Safari Live. We'll see you this afternoon. Bye now.